Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 10214 in the name of Angela Constance on improving entrepreneurship among women and young people in Scotland. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Minister, Cabinet Secretary, forgive me if you're ready, uh, 14 minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm very pleased to open this debate on promoting entrepreneurship uh, amongst women and uh, young people this afternoon. If we are to achieve our potential as a nation, uh, it is important that we give as many people as possible uh, the opportunity to reach their potential as individuals. And through entrepreneurship, people have the opportunity not just to create jobs for themselves, but to create jobs and exciting opportunities for others, uh, thus contributing uh, to our goal of sustainable economic growth. President officer, last November, the Scottish Government published Scotland Can Do. Uh, this is our national statement of intent towards becoming a world-leading uh, entrepreneurial and innovative nation. And a key aspect of Scotland Can Do is in the focus it has on helping those less represented uh, in the world of entrepreneurship and enterprise. We want everyone in Scotland to be in a position to realise their full potential in this field. And in particular, it is recognised that women and young people could benefit from further assistance and support. Uh, not only because they are uh, less uh, represented, and that's not right, uh, but also because of their huge uh, economic potential. So, for example, it has been estimated that if women's participation in enterprise matched that of men's, it could boost our economy by around 5%. So, for the sake of all our futures, uh, that kind of bonus uh, quite simply uh, cannot be ignored. And I am sure that colleagues will welcome the fact that Scotland Can Do is backed by £3 million of financial support uh, this year alone. And at the same time, uh, we are very clear uh, that neither money nor desire is enough to achieve that lasting cultural change uh, that is also required. So Scotland Can Do is clear about the importance of collaboration uh, right across the public, private and third sector. And equally, uh, we wish to promote a values-led entrepreneurship where uh, the goal of economic growth uh, goes hand in hand uh, with the goal of forging uh, a better society. And I believe it is only in this way that we can be sure uh, of reaping the, the full benefits of entrepreneurship for our nation. Now, President Officer, it is clear that the, the journey of developing an entrepreneurial mindset and behaviours uh, must begin in our schools. And enterprise education isn't so much about teaching enterprise as it is about being enterprising in our whole approach to learning and life. Equally, it is important that our young people uh, have the opportunity to experience and develop uh, an understanding of the nature of business, uh, for example, through high quality work placements. It is evident that a lot of great activity uh, already goes on in our schools, either independently uh, or with the help of organisations like Young Enterprise Scotland, uh, Micro Tigo, Bad Idea and the Social Enterprise Academy. And this has been encouraged by the likes of Sir Tom Hunter, uh, who in his support of MicroTigo has uh, recognised the importance of embedding uh, entrepreneurial attitudes uh, from an early age. And some of the stories of pupils' entrepreneurial endeavours uh, are really quite inspiring. Um, however, there are many demands uh, on teachers' time and we therefore need to make it as easy as possible uh, for school staff to take up the baton uh, of enterprise education and run. And that's why, as outlined in Scotland Can Do, we want to develop a resource for schools uh, that will make it easier for them to identify and draw on the range of support uh, that is out there. And that way, uh, even more uh, school pupils will get an understanding uh, of what entrepreneurship means for them. Now, building on this platform, we are also keen to help our colleges and universities uh, to develop a, a stronger focus and expertise, uh, particularly in drawing out the entrepreneurial talents uh, of their students. 
The Young Innovators Challenge uh, is an example of something that we have supported in recent years and that aims to do just that. It's uh, run by the, the Scottish Institute for Enterprise uh, and this challenge is all about guiding students through the, the process of developing a business idea and then building it towards an actual solution. And the focus of this year's challenge is on social innovation uh, with Scotland students being invited to submit ideas on things like healthcare and green energy. It is a very good example of the diversity of entrepreneurship and its relevance to everyday life. Meanwhile, we are proud also to be supporting the, the rollout uh, of the Bridge to Business initiative, uh, which aims to inspire, support and connect uh, college students uh, into business. And this follows a, a very successful pilot at the City of Glasgow College, which saw over 400 students uh, take part. So, apart from the education system, presiding officer, I think we can be proud of what is developing into a rich support network for budding young entrepreneurs in Scotland. And we have heard of the excellent work ongoing uh, with the, the Prince's Trust, uh, which offers uh, grants and loans to ambitious young entrepreneurs through its Youth Business Scotland scheme. And in addition, we have uh, We Are the Future, uh, which last year ran the, the largest entrepreneurship event uh, for young people in Britain, and who this year are taking some of Scotland's brightest young entrepreneurs over to San Francisco uh, for their first international startup summit. And in a similar vein, we're also supporting the Power of Youth uh, to run a series of residential events this year and next uh, that will support the development uh, of young entrepreneurs with international scope. So I think we can see that young people uh, have options uh, as far as exploring uh, entrepreneurship is concerned. The key thing, as far as I'm concerned, is to make sure uh, that all of our young people are aware of these opportunities and have the confidence to take advantage of them. Moving on, presiding officer, female entrepreneurship is an equally high priority for this government. Uh, this is not only a question of diversity or inclusion, uh, crucially important though that is, it is also a, a very simple uh, economic imperative. And as I mentioned earlier, if women's participation in business uh, matched that of men's, uh, it could boost the economy by 5%. And that equates to around £7.6 billion, uh, a not insignificant amount by anyone's reckoning. It could also create around 35,000 uh, direct jobs. And that is why uh, I was so pleased recently to attend uh, the launch of the new Women in Enterprise Action Framework, uh, not far from here uh, at Cranachan and Crowdy, just uh, up the high street there. And it was... Uh, uh, yes. Jenny Mara. I thank the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. On this very important point about women in business, would the uh, Cabinet Secretary agree with me that any policy to encourage enterprise for, for, for females, for anyone, has to really be traced back into the skills and training that are available. And looking to, to Labour's amendment today, actually the lack of places, both part-time and full-time, for women and returning women in our colleges is a severe impediment to, getting, to letting them pick up the qualifications and skills that will then spur them on into that enterprise. Minister, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm glad uh, Ms Mara could uh, turn up uh, to this afternoon's uh, debate. I think once again we are revisiting some uh, well-rehearsed arguments in this uh, chamber uh, with regards to college reform. And as Ms Mara well knows, um, that uh, headcount, um, the difficulty with headcount as she measures it, it treats courses uh, of a few hours long the same as uh, an HND course. And what we are trying to do um, with the very important uh, college reform is ensure that through regionalisation that there is very much a more uh, localised response to skills needs. No, thank you. I'm, no, I'm still answering your point, thank you. 
Um, and as we have moved towards uh, full-time courses with recognised qualifications uh, to the benefit uh, of young men and young women, that has had very positive uh, outcomes. We have more full-time students uh, studying for recognised qualifications. That's up uh, by 2,000. And the number of uh, higher national certificate achievements is also up um, by 36%. But this is not to, no thank you, this is not to the exclusion um, of part-time courses uh, or indeed uh, older learners. And if people are serious about women taking their very rightful place uh, in the economy, we have to ensure that women from all backgrounds can access the provision uh, that will actually get them into work or self-employment or other uh, well-paid uh, career opportunities. It, uh, as I was saying, President Officer, it's, it was a great opportunity to meet the, the female uh, proprietors um, of the store at Cranachan and Crowdy uh, when the Women in Enterprise Action Framework was, was launched. Uh, and it was certainly great to see that some of their stock um, and produce in the shop uh, was the result um, of female edge uh, winners. And it's important to note uh, that 46% uh, of the winners of Scottish Edge uh, were indeed women. And the action framework uh, that we launched sets out the, the range of actions uh, to help and encourage more women uh, to set up and succeed in business. And this is a very exciting piece of work that I have been involved in and that the Scottish Government has been pleased to support uh, right from the start. Um, indeed, we have supported Women's Enterprise Scotland to lead uh, on this important work with uh, no less than uh, £70,000 uh, over two years. And amongst other things, this has helped with the uh, development of an exciting new network uh, of female role models and mentors. And at the event, I also had the, the great pleasure of meeting some um, of these ambassadors who hail from a, a range of backgrounds, business sectors uh, and uh, locations. And they've all gone through their very own uh, unique journey and get to where they are now, which I believe makes them extremely well uh, equipped to connect and engage uh, with a wide audience. And that audience might range from schoolgirls right through to experienced uh, female businesswomen. But the key thing is that we encourage more and more women uh, to see themselves as entrepreneurs and to be ambitious uh, in what they set out uh, to achieve. It is well known, presiding officer, that women uh, can and do face uh, different uh, and additional challenges and barriers, uh, particularly when balancing the demands uh, of family and caring responsibilities. Um, however, in my view, uh, this makes women potentially more equipped uh, to be successful in the world of business, uh, but nonetheless, we have to be concerted in our efforts uh, to take down those uh, barriers. In conclusion, presiding officer, I believe that the Scotland Can Do Framework and Women in Enterprise Framework uh, sets out a direction of travel uh, which can help us radically change our economic fortunes uh, as well as the way our society functions. Uh, the new economy requires new ideas, uh, not to mention uh, ideals, and that is where both women and young people have a very significant role to play, uh, both in terms of promoting those new ideas and ideals, uh, but also in growing our economy. So, President Officer, I uh, move the motion uh, in my name and uh, intimate that um, I won't be supporting uh, Labour's amendment today as it misrepresents the nature and ambition of college reform and is trying to take the, the debate back and not forward. Uh, I will, however, be supporting the Tory amendment um, as I'm already on record along with the COSLA uh, spokesperson of welcoming uh, the final publication um, of the, the Wood Report. Uh, both myself and the COSLA spokesperson um, have described the, the Wood Report as a landmark report um, and I'll now be working very closely uh, with COSLA uh, to bring forward the plans to implement that report and uh, I will be reporting back to Parliament on the 17th of this month, I believe, uh, in the form of a ministerial statement. Uh, so I move the motion uh, in my name, President Officer. Thanks. And I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to and move Amendment 10214.1. Ms Mara, you have 10 minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I apologise to you for, for being slightly late to the Chamber this afternoon. This is not the first time we have come to the Chamber to address the impact of gender inequality on our economy, and nor will it be the last. 
But I hope that this debate will not rage on for too much longer, presiding officer. I hope that very soon there will be recognition across Scotland, the UK, Europe and the wider world that only when women are an integral, integral driving force in the economy will our economy be stronger, more prosperous and more sustainable. Now, today we are focused on what can be done here in Scotland to allow women to set up their own businesses. And already this year, we have seen movement from the Scottish Government on the role of women in our economy and decision making. Nicola Sturgeon committed to gender quotas on the boards of private companies as she launched uh, the White Paper for Independence in September. And Shona Robison upset her loyal horses in Dundee SNP last week by committing to 40% gender quotas on public boards. Now, the Minister may still have to win that debate in the unreformed ranks of her own councillors and party, but she will find friends on these benches for that policy, long committed as a party to 50-50 representation and driving it through our own elected structures. Labour tabled amendments on 40-40-20 gender quotas for public boards two years ago. The SNP voted against my amendments that day, but I am delighted that they have now been won round to the policy today. And why are women's voices important on these boards? Presiding officer, for the same reasons, I think, that we must do everything we can to let women's business flourish. Because when only one part of the community is represented, or is predominantly represented, then decisions are made predominantly in that section's favour. And this applies to business and consumption, as well as decisions for public services. Presiding officer, I am co-convener of the cross-party group on computer games in this parliament. This industry is dominated by men. In several discussions, both private with the sector and in parliament here in the cross-party group, the gender issue has been raised. How can we get more women into the industry, into the computer games industry? How can we get more women to start their own gaming companies? Why is this important? I ask the industry experts. And they answer me this. Because women are becoming bigger consumer of games and online experience. And so more female intuitive products will sell better to more female consumers. Now this makes sense to me. Clearly, the female market in gaming is not yet fully exploited, but it will probably only be so when women are designing the games and leading the companies that market and sell them. So having more women in business is about economic expansion. It's about exploiting new markets and finding opportunities in new markets. Now, I put this thesis to the entrepreneurial exchange in a conversation I had with them yesterday in advance of this debate. And the entrepreneurial exchange agreed with this. They also raised issues of confidence among women to take that plunge into business. They identified also the tendency for women who are returning into work after their children's early years to take the decision at that point in their lives to set up a business, perhaps in their late 30s or early 40s. So it is with this in mind from the industry experts that I, that I analyse the findings of the government's proposals for women in enterprise. And there is much in there that I think will be very useful. The mentoring and networking schemes and the role model project. I was pleased to see that the Scottish Government will be reaching out beyond the public sector networks and working hand in hand with the Prince's Trust, Entrepreneurial Spark and the Entrepreneurial Exchange. As ever, presiding officer, these schemes will be successful with key ambassadors and awareness of the support that is available for them. On gender specific support, point four in the Minister's report, I know that the Scottish Government will hold the conversations with the banks to encourage them to develop their female customers' businesses. But I wonder if the Minister will return to the Chamber at a later date to update us on how those conversations go and what commitments or initiatives that the banks in Scotland are taking 
to take this forward. Because I think it's good to hold the conversations, but if this is going to be part of the government's strategy, then we need to be able to scrutinise uh, what action has been taken and how that is going. Presiding officer, can I turn now to the amendments to today's motion? Labour will be supporting the Conservative amendment tonight, as we agree that there is much in the Wood Commission that is to be commended. Indeed, I had half expected this afternoon's debate until I received the motion to be on the Wood Commission report um, since it was released earlier this week. But I hope that we will have a chance to debate this very important document in full before the summer recess. Joanne Lamont and I met with Sir Ian Wood uh, just last week and we are very grateful to him for the time and commitment that he has put into examining the challenges around youth employment in Scotland. It is a seminal report. It has a lot of key recommendations, and I know that the Cabinet Secretary will want to bring it before Parliament before the summer recess to make sure that we scrutinise it and do it justice uh, straight after its publication. Presiding officer, on the Labour Party's amendment to the government motion this afternoon, we have put college places into the agenda of this debate because I really don't think we can seriously consider new opportunities for women and youth skills and ignore the underfunding of our colleges. Indeed, central to this debate and to the proposals in the Wood Commission, which the Cabinet Secretary is backing, is opportunities in further education. It underpins both the Wood Commission and the substance of today's debate. Presiding officer, I was actually very, very surprised at the Minister's um, response to my intervention in her opening speech because she seemed to suggest, she said that I misrepresent the nature of college reform. Presiding officer, the Labour amendment this afternoon says that the loss of 140,000 college places since 2007-2008 is undermining the achievement of this objective. Presiding officer, the 140,000 less college places since this government took power is a figure straight from the Cabinet Secretary's own agency, the Scottish Funding Council. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, given way. I wonder if she would acknowledge that headcount has reduced because full-time uh, equivalent and full-time courses have increased. And I also wonder if she would acknowledge uh, the funding floor uh, that has been allocated to this college sector of £522 million, increasing to £526 million, and how that is more uh, than Labour ever invested in any one year in the sector. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary can dance on the head of a pin on this, but anyone in this Parliament who speaks to people in their communities who are on waiting lists in colleges and knows the struggle that, that women and returning women are getting to get into uh, to college will know that, that, that her statistics really don't represent the, the reality of the situation. The 140... The 140... Yes. Jonah McLeod. So, from Ms Manners' response to the, government, gov the Minister's intervention, the Cabinet Secretary's intervention, do you not accept that FTE's full-time equivalence is the accepted measure of how many people are at colleges? That's the accepted measure, accepted by all statisticians, including SPICE, who just recently said that FTE numbers are stable. And indeed, the Scottish Government has 116,399 extra pla uh, places in 2012-13, exceeding our manifesto commitment on full-time equivalent places. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, I accept the information that Scottish Founding Council give me, which is 140,000 less college places and a much, and a much, and a much more difficult environment for women to get back into college. Presiding officer, Women making the decision to go into business in their late 30s or early 40s, as identified by the Entrepreneurial Exchange, are less likely to do so if they have not been able to pick up qualifications and skills and college skills in their early 20s. And we know that the Scottish Government's current focus on 16 to 19 year olds is having a detrimental impact on women returners. So as always, we need to trace that policy further back to ensure that women can make the decision to start their own businesses, college places must be available to them. 
Presiding officer, we make no apology for highlighting the college sector again. It underpins the growth of business and the critical recommendations in the Wood Commission. If the Scottish Government is committed to both these objectives, then they would be wise to vote for our amendment this evening and seriously review the number of college places that Scotland needs. The objectives of, objectives of the Wood Commission and women and entrepreneurship are seriously undermined if they fail to do so. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and move amendment 10214.3. Mr Fraser, up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, as the uh, first man to speak in this debate. Uh, uh, and a debate, I suspect, will be subject to its own gender imbalance. I'm feeling a little bit outnumbered. I'm sure you will protect me, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. But can I welcome the okay, Scottish sir. Government giving us the opportunity this afternoon to debate this very important issue of improving entrepreneurship. And it's fair to say that our record as a country generally in this area has not been a good one. Over many years, our business startup rate generally has lagged behind the UK as a whole, although I note that the latest stats show that new business and corporations are at an all-time high. And we have, as Angela Constance has pointed out, a gender gap. For whatever reason, men are more likely to take risks in setting up businesses than women. And some of these concerns were identified by the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee uh, last year um, and highlighted in our report to Parliament on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2013-14. Last week, the Strathclyde University Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship published its Global Entrepreneurship Monitor report for 2013. And there were some interesting observations in here in relation to the difference between men and women when it comes to setting up businesses. According to the Hunter Centre, men and women entrepreneurs tend to create different types of businesses and fund their startups differently. Half of all businesses run by women are consumer orientated. Compared with their counterparts in other similar nations, Scottish female business owners are less likely to export and fewer of them expect to grow the business significantly in the next five years. Compared to their counterparts elsewhere in the UK, female entrepreneurs are more likely to completely self-fund their business which clearly has an impact on the scale of businesses they can create uh, and how quickly they're likely to grow. There also seems to be, according to this report, a difference in motivation between male and female entrepreneurs, in that wealth creation tends to be of secondary importance to most women, but not all. According to the report, women entrepreneurs tend to identify existing customer needs that are not currently being met and use information from previous working experience and from networks, especially family members, to create solutions to meet uh, these unmet needs. Now, the Cabinet Secretary's motion refers to the CANDO programme and women in enterprise, and certainly these initiatives are welcome. The CANDO programme sets out a framework to increase entrepreneurship and innovation activity from individuals and businesses in Scotland, resulting in more business being formed and new products and services from existing businesses. And it is its stated ambition that people from all walks of life develop entrepreneurial skills. If I have a criticism of this approach, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that it is heavy on ambition, but light on detailed proposals to take that ambition forward. In our contribution in her uh, amendment, Jenny Mara draws attention to the cut in college places under the SNP government having a negative impact on women coming into the workforce and developing entrepreneurial skills. I think that's a perfectly fair point to make and we will be happy to support the Labour Amendment. But I think it is perhaps a distraction from the main theme of this debate, and therefore, uh, if Jenny Mara will forgive me, I'd rather turn the remainder of my remarks to our own amendment, which refers to the excellent Wood uh, report published on Tuesday of this week. We on this side of this chamber have argued for years for an improvement in vocational education, and I'm delighted to see Sir Ian Wood's commission supporting this objective. We know that whilst unemployment as a whole is coming down, youth unemployment is still a problem. According to the report, youth unemployment levels are currently 18.8%, more than double that of the average working age population. One in five of our young people aspire to get a job, but cannot get one. Of the 50% of our young people who don't go to university, very few leave school with vocational qualifications with labour market currency. For school pupils, work experience absolutely vital in the modern world is generally limited to one week in S4. As Sir Ian Wood's report says, this is simply not good enough. The report recommends that youngsters of all abilities 
should have the opportunity to follow industry uh, and vocational pathways alongside academic studies. And the report proposes new school college vocational partnerships, as well as an option to do the first year of a three to four year apprenticeship while still at school. There's also a, a very important focus on the need to improve the status of vocational education. So it is not seen, as it often is, as a second best alternative for those unwilling or unable to go down the academic route. We should look to the example of Germany, which uh, for years has been a leader in Europe in terms of science and innovation, and undoubtedly has retained its manufacturing base to a much greater extent than we in this country have. And I have no doubt that a major factor here has been the attractiveness of careers in science, engineering and technology, not necessarily at a graduate level, but also at a technician level. And there's no sense in Germany that people who do these jobs are in any way second class to other professions. I think this is absolutely crucial in terms of how we're going to approach this subject and develop uh, better career opportunities and a more entrepreneurial culture for our young people. So we need to learn from Germany. It's very good to see some of this recognised in Sir Ian Wood's report, particularly the recommendation that a focus on STEM subjects uh, should be at the heart of development of Scotland's young workforce. Presiding officer, there's a great deal in Sir Ian Wood's report, and I appreciate it was only published on Tuesday, and therefore I think it's unreasonable to expect even the Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary, as able uh, as the one we have today to come up with a detailed response so soon. But what my amendment does is welcome the recommendations and ask the Scottish Government to bring forward plans to implement these as soon as possible. I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's indication of support uh, for this and her indication of support for my amendment. I think it's important we all work together to see better vocational education in Scotland to help both assist employment and entrepreneurship among our young people. And for that reason, I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move to open debate speakers. And I call Willie Rennie to be followed by Christine Graham up to seven minutes this afternoon. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. It's a pleasure to take part in this afternoon's debate. I'm not especially qualified, I think, neither being a woman nor am I young anymore. But I'm ready to stand beside Murdo Fraser in his defence um, on that side of the debate. It's a, some say that's not a change. Some say that's not a change. <laughs> it's a pleasure, however, to take part in the debate this afternoon. A celebration of the potential that we have in Scotland, in our women and young people. I agree with an awful lot of what has been said this afternoon. Um, and I want to put on, my, on the record my party's support for the all-hands-on-deck approach of the Wood Commission. It's an approach we need if we are to improve youth employability. The message from Sir Ian's report is that giving more young people the chance they need to get on in life is a collective responsibility. It needs public, private and third sector to play their part with every school, college, university, business and government stepping up to the plate. This is truly a real challenge which has been thrown down, but one in our party, in the Liberal Democrats, we are accepting without reservation. And we are pleased to support the Conservative Party amendment today in that light. There's no doubting the talents and the potential of women and young people across Scotland, but we need to do so much more to unlock that potential to ensure that every individual has the opportunity to fulfil it. And I recognise much of what the Minister says in terms of the rich support network that is out there to try and nurture that support and so that those young people can achieve their potential with the range of organisations and facilities that she has outlined. And it's just as much we recognise the work that the Scottish Government is doing in this area, it's also worth recognising some of the significant changes that have happened at a UK level that also assist us in this ambition. The shared flexible parental leave brought in by the coalition government at Westminster should be welcomed as a means by which both parents can keep strong links with their workplaces and one through which organisations can be helped to attract and retain women employees. Likewise, the tax-free childcare, which will help working families across Scotland within, with the UK government having increased in the latest budget the cost cap on tax-free childcare to £10,000. That means that families will receive up to £2,000 of childcare support per child, 
which is two-thirds more than was originally planned. That complements very much the work that the Scottish Government has been doing on expanding childcare and nursery education, and one which we support as well. But, however, I want to concentrate uh, on one area this afternoon, one as someone who studied uh, biology, which is close to my heart. That's the, the STEM subjects in Scotland. It's hugely valuable economically, but it's also one where we need to put an awful lot more effort to unlock and retain the potential of female STEM students and professionals. Around two-thirds of those studying life sciences in further higher and postgraduate education are women. But that is not reflected in the workplace, where just 46% of employees are female. The rate of loss of women moving from higher education to employment in STEM is more than double the loss of their male counterparts. 73% of female graduates leave the STEM industry and 21% of those are unemployed. That is a massive loss to Scotland's skill base where STEM and life sciences are flourishing. At board level, if we look at board level, fewer than one in five directors of life sciences companies in Scotland in 2010 were female, and only 9% of professors in STEM subjects were women. You can see the decline as they progress through the, or climb up the ladder in the university sector. The number of women declines quite rapidly as you progress further up the ladder. Tapping all our ta talents, women in science, technology, engineering and maths, a strategy for Scotland, which was published by the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2012, concluded that this wasted female talent, and I quote, is a serious loss across the whole economy, and that a doubling of women's high-level skill contribution to the economy would be worth as much as £170 million per annum to Scotland. That is why more needs to be done to ensure that that talent is retained, valued and recognised in the STEM sector. There is a lot of good work which has already been done, however. A recent conference of the Equate Scotland focused on supporting and developing female STEM staff and students, highlighting the positive impact of the Athena Swan recognition scheme. And at an industry level, GlaxoSmithKline, the pharmaceutical company, has signed the WISE Chief Executive Officer Charter to demonstrate the company's active support of increasing the participation of women at all levels in STEM. That is something that we should recognise and we should celebrate. The Labour Party amendment picked up on the massive hit that college places have taken place under this government. Colleges are essential for training and skills, and we need to ensure that the opportunity of high quality further education continues to be an option in Scotland. Lifelong learning, the ability to upskill is essential and is particularly valuable in areas like STEM, where courses can be focused to meet specific employer demands or can focus on refresher training for those who have taken a career break. We will be supporting Labour's amendment today. Addressing the gender imbalance in STEM will take the same kind of all-hands-on-deck approach as the Wood Commission has espoused for tackling youth employment. We should embrace both of these challenges without hesitation. By doing so, we will be unlocking not just the individual potential of women and young people, but also the valuable contribution which they can make to Scotland's skill base and our economy. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm going to speak to the very early part of the Government's motion that the Parliament recognises the positive impact of entrepreneurial activity by women. Uh, and I'm going to do so by referring to some of the very entrepreneurial women in my own patch in the Scottish Borders and Midlothian. And some of what I'm going to say will exa be examples, really, of um, matters that um, Murdo Fraser raised about the kind of uh, activities that women enter into. Most of them are, in fact, in the consumer area and family orientated. So I was interested in his speech uh, as I um, saw, identified this in my own. And where better to start than there's one in my own patch in Gore Bridge, and the woman in question is Lynn Mann of Supernature Oils in Gore Bridge. It started, as so often enterprises do for women, as a sideline. 
and when she at first said she would commit two years to help getting a family business off the ground, but now it's full-time and an expanding job. Although she says herself her father encouraged her to be entrepreneurial, she had to overcome cultural and social hurdles facing her as a potential businesswoman. I'll come back to that. I would also just say in passing that the role of my own parents in encouraging young women to be adventurous and ambitious is very significant. My own father made sure his four daughters knew from the start that they would and should have the same opportunities as their brother. And that was in the days when girls, at least working class girls like me, generally left school at 15, got engaged at 18, married at 20, had a first child at 22. I, partly due to my father's intervention, did not follow that route map, but so many of the girls in that day did. And indeed, not that culture, but some of the route maps that girls are destined to take is deeply embedded even all these years on. But back to Lynn Mann, who laughingly on Supernatural's website explains how she had 22 jobs before the business took off, but how somehow all that experience has been useful in making the family business of cold-pressed rapeseed oil succeed. That, together with support from the Edge Fund and eSpark, has done the trick, as I saw for myself in a recent visit, where she and her husband and an expanding number of employees press, infuse and bottle the product. And she is now a women's enterprise ambassador helping other women find those business feet. There are other models, mentors, as it were, in waiting. There's Ruth Hinks, Master Chocolatier and UK Confection of the Year in 2011, located in Peebles with her business, Coco Black, dangerously delicious chocolate and extraordinary sculpting of chocolate exhibits. She has also now expanded into a chocolate and pastry school above the cafe at the Cuddy Bridge, Peebles. I'm warning you, if you cross that threshold, don't count the calories. Her entrepreneurial DNA kicked in when, at a young age, she asked her parents for money for some must-have gizmo at the time. She was told she had to raise the money herself. Dismissing a potato-growing enterprise because it would too take too long for them to develop to be marketable and that there would not be a high profit margin, she made her first chocolate Easter egg. And the rest, as they say, is Hink's history. Then there's Deborah Riddle of Breadshare, a community interest company involving the community in making nutritious bread using only natural ingredients. I've had a go. Marginally successful. And it's currently located at La Manca, near Whitmuir Farm, where you will find Heather Anderson and her husband with her impressive organic farm and produce. They are in the process of this becoming the first community-owned farm in Scotland. I even have bought a share. I was also, however, interested in the Cabinet Secretary's reference to healthcare, entrepreneurial exercises in healthcare, because, as we know, women of enterprise and entrepreneurial uh, abilities are not only to be found in business. And my last example is of Linda Davidson and Rebecca Wade, two midwives. How can they be entrepreneurial? You're asking yourself if you're still listening to me. How can those white midwives from NHS borders recently won an award for partnership working with Scottish Borders Council to enhance child reading and parenting services in the borders, working with very vulnerable young mums and sometimes young dads from antenatal through to looking after the baby and indeed even looking after themselves. Well, they're pursuing the idea of a specialised residential facility for vulnerable young parents and their babies to provide support and to help them learn how to be successful and sometimes to break a cycle of bad parenting that they themselves have been through. It is early days, but their ideas, rooted in their pragmatic experiences, and I think this is where women have the edge, they're very pragmatic, are not only exciting, but sensible. And I hope to help where I can to take these forward. There are many, many more women I've met across the constituency in business, the professions, the voluntary sectors, I'm sure you have, full of good and practical ideas. And we should, as a nation, applaud, encourage, support and value them. But that's not only our job. 
in delivering childcare, mentoring, help with start-up, for example. And it's not just the job of the formal education system, but that of family and friends and the surrounding community. Changing that culture, which Lynn Mann, where I started this speech, which she met and which many still have to meet and have to overcome. Many thanks. And I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Thank you very much, President Officer. That young women, and there are now more uh, women graduates and male ones, should still be victims of outdated and ingrained chauvinism is shocking. At least half of the skills base for a new independent Scotland lies with women. Graduates are not, but too many of them remain frightened to test out their own entrepreneurial talent. It's almost as if the culture is willing us to fail, one young woman told me. That setting up a business is too big a gamble and you're somehow bound to fail. That's the attitude that we have to break and it's an attitude that we have to take head on. Go on, try it, start out on your own. The worst that can happen is your first attempt doesn't work, work out, but you might end up the next Anita Roddick, for instance. It's not so different from your first job. It's not likely to be where you stay all of your life, but the experience you gain will take you to the next turning in your life. Increasingly, the number of women entrepreneurs to match the number of men would generate more than seven billion for our economy. It's just a huge impact. And this government wants to achieve that goal and it wants to make sure that the infrastructure is in place to encourage women, especially young women, to pick up and run with their entrepreneurial ideas. Last week in the garden lobby, there was an event that looked at um, AIDS and adaptations for people, and I met um, Catherine Bland. Catherine had an accident, which meant she was on crutches for a number of months, not letting having crutches get in the way of her busy, busy life. She developed a homemade product, which she called the Hopper. And it's essentially a big belt apron with lots of pockets in it that holds everything you need for your busy day. And she liked to bake, so she would have all her baking stuff. When she was liking to read, she would have her magazines, she would have her phone, and for other people, for medication and things. A brilliant idea, an absolutely brilliant idea. She now developed that homemade idea as a product and has helped transform the lives of many, many people with injuries and disabilities. A simple idea, but a brilliant idea. There is a 13.3% gap between men and women's full-time hourly rate and 33.7% gap when you compare women's part-time hourly rate to men's full-time hourly rate. And if you had any doubt that women are undervalued, then what about the fact that parental childcare is not counted towards GDP and is categorised as leisure? We test that out. Many of us across this chamber would have either brought up toddlers or had spent time with toddlers. Did you call it leisure? In some cases it was, but in lots of cases it was hard work. And I'll tell you something, your people management and your negotiation skills are very well honed in that, that situation. But just seven of Scotland's top 30 listed companies had a female executive two years ago. Only 37 out of 242 board positions, both executive and non-executive, and the top 30 companies were occupied by women in 2012. Even though there are annual increases, 27.6% is the figure in 2012. That left 84.7% of the seats filled by men. Currently, Scottish women make up 52% of the population. In October 2013, the level of female employment in Scotland reached its highest level since 1992 at 69%. And if you look at the progress on that, female self-employment has increased over recent years from 80,800 in 2008 to 93,900 uh, 93, 93, in 2013, showing an increase of 16.2%. Currently, only 21% of SME employers are women-led and only 31% of self-employed Scots are women. To address this enterprise gap, the Scottish Government established a series of workshops in 2013, chaired by Professor Sarah Carter, former head of the Hunter Centre and Strathclyde University, and Jackie Briarton of Women's Enterprise Scotland. A, a great advance. This can-do attitude reaps rewards, and it reaps great rewards. Women, as I said earlier, now make up the majority of university graduates, but we do not see that reflected in our boardrooms. At the moment, the Scottish Government does not have the legislative power required to change that situation, 
We have some of it and we're doing what we can, but we do need that yes vote to take it further. My colleague Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson says in her Women on Board report, and I quote, our aim for Scotland is to make the best use of the talents of all of our people, regardless of age, race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability or religion. And I don't think they are just words. I think the actions that have been shown now, and certainly I do believe that everyone across this chamber would support that as well. By taking actions on these issues, we will be improving economic participation by removing the barriers that stand in the way of women realising their potential. £7 billion worth of improving economic participation. It will also contribute to making Scotland a wealthier and fairer, fairer place, something I think we all want, ensuring no one is held back because of their gender and ensuring that public bodies are more fairly reflective of the society as a whole. We can do and, and improve the situation. We are already very active in listening and challenging assumptions. I think we all do that every day of our lives. We're encouraging employers to offer more flexible home-based and part-time work, and we're seeking to get rid of the stereotyping that goes on in the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. The Cabinet Secretary will be very, very well aware of how that's one of my bugbears when you see uh, posters that show the men with ladders and the girls with um, the women with um, scissors because they're cutting hair when the boys are building. I'd like to swap that round, Cabinet Secretary. Let's give the women the ladders and the hard hats, and let's give the men the aprons and the scissors. I think that would be great. Anyway, that's just a wee aside for me. <laughs> we have made great strides in apprenticeships, and we know that, and we continue to make those strides, but getting women into apprenticeships has to be a priority. The most crucial and obvious change is in the transformational childcare policy, and once we raise the money to do that, the difference that it will make, the difference that will make to the opportunities for women is threefold. More women in work increases the tax take, more job opportunities in childcare to meet that aspiration and a more positive, motivated outlook for women and their children. History has dictated that women stay at home, mind the children or elderly relatives and not only don't get paid for it, but give up any right to a career they previously had. Poor supply and high costs of childcare prevent women from working. It is in recognition of that reality and the follow-on truth that their absence constricts our economic growth. That this government has promised an entirely different approach to childcare will make that difference. We have the foresight to see that if we open the doors, women will come through into the workplace with competence, with confidence, and if we create those opportunities, the results are endless. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now call on Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I very much welcome the strategy, as I do welcome the opportunity to debate it. Um, I'm pleased to see the Shadow Cabinet Secretary in her sorry, the Shadow Cabinet Secretary in her place and focusing on the gender aspect of her brief. Um, I've been reflecting um, on the past few years, and in particular the, the youth unemployment crisis that we've had and what we've experienced and to a degree are still recovering from. And, and governments of all hues across the whole of Europe responded by appealing to the big multinational companies. They were competing to bring new jobs, new facilities um, to their respective shores, often with cash incentives. And then a couple of years after that, many of these companies uh, were embroiled in tax avoidance schemes, which led to a huge amount of public outrage. And the political response to that was to start to talk about a more responsible capitalism. Yes, pay your taxes, but if you're receiving public money, we expect you to do more things. We expect you to pay a living wage. We expect you to build in apprenticeships into your con contracts. We expect you not to promote zero hours uh, culture. We expect you not to be involved in blacklisting or ever have done so. But it's always been about bartering with the big guys and, and too often the big guys win. Yes, we can make demands of them, but if we go too far, you push them away and you lose the investment in your own country's future. So could we imagine a different type of economy, an economy built on homegrown business that prides itself on being decent employers rooted in the communities they employ as well as the communities that they buy and sell from? Realising that ambition requires a, a change of culture and arguably we don't value businesses enough in Scotland. We've got a proud history as a nation of public service but perhaps we're less proud of people who choose to make their own money and how they go about doing that. Pro-business in Scotland tends to mean that you believe in low taxes and you believe in deregulation, when it could be about being an enterprising nation, that a nation that's confident that engenders skills and the belief in the great traditions of our nation and giving those to the next generation. 
Setting up your own business is not only a thing that could be good for you, but good for your community. And that type of attitude has got to start in schools, in colleges and in universities. It's only when we get a critical mass in the next generation will we be able to drive the cultural change that we're looking for. And that applies in a number of ways. If you think about the debates that we've had in this chamber about work readiness and what it means to be ready for work, it's very often talked about in the context of matching the skills that come out of our schools and our colleges with the skills of what business needs. But it's always a supply chain for somebody else's business. We never talk about work readiness in the context of setting up your own business and what that looked like and might mean. There should be much more emphasis on setting up uh, businesses in all courses across colleges and universities and indeed in schools. Young people should be taught about rates and how they work. They should be taught about tax and what HMRC is and what happens when you fall on the wrong side of it. They should be taught about digitising business and the new opportunities that come from that. Markets, how to pitch turnover versus profit. Can you recruit to grow? What's the balance of risk? These are all staple issues for business students, but they should be built into all courses in all different types of areas and it shouldn't just be a unitary extra it shouldn't just be and this week class we're going to talk about how to set up your own business it should be embedded into the ethos of what happens in our colleges and in our universities setting up a business should be an option for all students and students in our colleges should be told it's an option for students like you I look at uh, what my own college, Edinburgh College, does in Ed Edinburgh on a number of different uh, campuses. And you've got mechanics, joiners, hairdressers, web designers, fitness instructors coming out of that every week. They're all predisposed to work for themselves, but so often it's not an option to them. They could start out with a start up, but they need a bit more help. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a lonely activity. You, you pair that web designer with the fitness instructor, and there's a, a whole new business model there that could be explored. And it could be the job of a college or a school or a university to encourage that type of activity because what needs to happen is we need to de-risk the process. Colleges could help by investing in some of these individuals to help them put their first foot on the ladder knowing that the rewards of that investment could come back to the college. Incubating those types of ideas and encouraging people to work together knowing that the benefits of that comes back to the college community and for the benefit of everyone else. I spoke earlier today to a former chair of the FSB in Edinburgh, who's an excellent female role model for women in business in her own right. And I asked her, what does she want from a strategy that encourages women uh, into business? And she said, more role models. And it was really funny because I'd had a, a similar conversation with an academic at Edinburgh University yesterday about the challenges around trying to engage women in science subjects. And she said role models too. But it's not just to be the role models at the top of a particular industry. Industry. It's not about the elite, it's about role models at every stage of the journey. So yes, Michelle Moan is a fantastic role model for women in business, but so is the women that Christina McKelvey was talking about, or Christine Graham was, in their own communities already operating and running their own businesses. It's those stories that we need to tell, so that women who are thinking about setting up a business can see somebody like them doing the same thing and draw strength from that. And the same applies to women that are already established in a business environment that want to help expand and grow that business, to take that risk, to employ more people, to offer a different product. They need to be able to meet more women like them in order to take on that type of risk. So in closing, presiding officer, the first challenge is to see more uh, females in business full stop, but let's not miss out on the opportunity to make sure that we get that right and have the right mix of women put to the forefront in our public debate around this agenda, and I'm sure that the, sh the Cabinet Secretary will take that on board. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Up to seven minutes, please. Hey, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I was getting slightly concerned earlier on in the debate when I was listening to Murdo Fraser because I was actually agreeing with them <laughs> in most aspects. And it's perhaps getting slightly worrying that uh, the convener of the e Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee and myself seem to agree on quite a number of matters. Um, so perhaps maybe some of my own uh, 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 persuasions is rubbing off on the convener. Uh, presiding officer, um, <laughs> presiding officer, like Willie Rennie, like Murdo Fraser, uh, I'm male. I'm no longer young, young at heart perhaps. Uh, but I do represent perhaps a minority group. And, and when we were, the uh, Cabinet Secretary mentioned the Can Do initiative, it took me back to uh, an earlier stage in my life. 
in the, t in, in the way and the aspect that I probably was looking forward to my own career. It would have been so simple in my own case to sit back and think of barriers, obstacles, hazards, reasons why not to, reasons that could have been presented, I think, quite often by my family and teachers not to get into certain, uh, a certain profession. Maybe it's my stubbornness, but I think it is about the, the can-do mentality. And I think this is something that we, we need to realise. I think the Cabinet Secretary probably would realise this from her social work training days. And as a person here that uh, didn't aspire to having a degree but followed a professional uh, qualification, Presiding Officer, I am aware that it does take ambition. I am aware that it does take strength and I am aware it does take determination and I think our young people have the qualities and determination and the qualities that can aspire for many to become entrepreneurs of the future but it's not just looking at where we are today we've really got to look in the future we've got to look in this sort of mid to long term and in reading Serene's report although just launched there are many aspects from that report that does reflect the can-do mentality that maybe perhaps we can all aspire to. But he does highlight, he does highlight some of the, the barriers that maybe does prevent some of our young people taking that initial step. Some of these aspects have been mentioned by other members. The cultural aspect. And that culture isn't down just to the way we are taught in schools. That culture is sometimes uh, embedded in home in our families, grandparents saying to their grandchildren, no, don't go into that profession. No, no, you'd be better sticking to whatever. And really, we need to try and ensure that we can break down that sort of stereotypical aspect. And I remember when, we were in the, when I was in the Equal Opportunities Committee and we are looking at the women in work, we, we went way back to looking at how we project things, even at nursery and the education of our young children and how we actually, you know, present toys to our children. As a father of, of two young girls, I remember there were four at the time, and um, when asked what they would like from Santa, they asked for racing cars. Obviously, I thought at that time we probably had maybe broken the mould. That, you know, my girls wanted racing cars as opposed to Barbies. And when they did get their Barbies in a pram, they dismantled the pram and made it into a go-kart. So, so maybe we did get rid of this a stereotypical aspect. And maybe they're doing things that maybe I had aspired to do but never managed. But, presiding officer... We've got to look at providing the appropriate opportunities for our young people at the early stages. And the curriculum for excellence is that pathway. That does open the doors for many of our young children. Many of our young uh, children, boys and girls, to aspire to what they would like to be, what they want to be. And we shouldn't create the barriers. We should be looking at their can-do what they would like to do, and reinforce that as best we can. Not every young person will aspire to go into university, quite rightly so. But if they choose to go down the, 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 the vocational route, we should be applauding that. Murdo Fraser was absolutely right. In Germany, I said absolutely right, I'll take that back. Murdo Fraser was right. Can't give him an absolute. Um, but Murdo Fraser was right in Germany. They're, they're very sort of, they, they reward they applaud people going into that sort of vocational aspects. Tradesmen. We need plumbers. We need mechanics. We need engineers. We need electrical engineers. We need, we need people to... Yes? Imara? To ask the uh, member, I, I think it's a very interesting point about Germany. And, and would he agree that perhaps um, the German situation has been helped by legislative measures that have put the onus on business to actually take on young apprentices uh, within contracts? And would he agree um, that perhaps we, the Scottish Government should maybe consider similar legislative measures to, to encourage that youth employment? Another 90 seconds, Mr Robertson, or thereby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
I mean, I, I actually think the, the Scottish Government have done a, an absolute wonderful job in promoting apprenticeships. Uh, over 25,000 apprenticeships, you know, and I, I think that there's always the, the aspect of doing more. But certainly business themselves can open their doors to, uh, to encouraging more apprentices. Only about 13 per cent of business at the moment offer um, a, um, apprenticeships to our young people. So what I'd be saying is let's, let's take that can-do mentality, let's promote that can-do mentality, and let's get the job done. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thanks very much. Now call on John McAlpine to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, seven minutes or thereby, we have a bit of time in hand this afternoon. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think the contributions today, particularly people talking about their own constituents, shows that there's absolutely no lack of talent and ambition amongst our young people and amongst Scottish women. A number of years ago, I remember that the big debate in Scotland was around the low level of business start-ups, and we spent a long time wringing our hands about whether we had the cult a culture that was hostile to entrepreneurship, and some very bizarre theories, as I recall, from my journalist days were advanced, uh, such as that the self-starters had all immigrated to Canada in the 19th century. So I'm very pleased that we've moved on from that rather negative nasal gazing towards encouraging and supporting the very many people across Scotland who are absolutely passionate about starting and growing their own business. And I very much welcome this government's commitment to increase the number of entrepreneurs and the role that can be played by the Scotland Can Do strategy uh, that uses a Team Scotland approach to bring together companies, universities, public agencies and customers to take advantage of the opportunities that drive the establishment and the growth of new businesses. We can't overemphasise the importance of this subject and I was uh, very impressed reading through the Scottish Government's Scotland Can Do uh, strategy document and I just wanted to quote um, page six which as well as innovation says that demand from consumers is the most important factor in the success or failure of a business. Uh, now, Murdo Fraser earlier mentioned a report that said women are more responsive to consumer demand. And uh, that was a point that was also made by Christine Graham um, in her speech. And I think that's, a, that's a, a very important point. I mean, I totally agree with Willie Rennie and others who have talked about the importance of STEM subjects and getting more women uh, excelling in those STEM subjects and making a career out of it. I've got a, a daughter who is a professional engineer and I should say she did play with the uh, Barbies when she was young. <laughs> um, in fact, she came home last Christmas and we had a big Barbie makeup stand that she played with when she was a little girl and she dismantled it and retrieved the spring from it and fixed my doorbell. So maybe, <laughs> maybe Barbie ha has her uses after all. But I think while I'm very, very encouraging of this, uh, getting more women into STEM subjects and, and those kind of technical jobs, I don't think that we should forget women's responsiveness to c consumers and the female economy. I mean, a lot of the most entrepreneurial women I know work in fashion and beauty and hairdressing and set up their own businesses. And I think the challenge there is to make sure that those uh, businesses are properly rewarded and taken seriously. Yes. Dennis Robertson. Uh, the, 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 the women that you're referring to, did they do that by choice or did they do it by, because they felt that that was the only opportunities because of the sort of stereotypical aspects of the trade? John McAlpine. I would say that the women who uh, I'm referring to that run, say, their own beauty or hairdressing business did do it by choice and did feel very passionate about it. And while, as I say, as the mother of a professional engineer, I totally encourage women who uh, to going into um, technical professions. But at the same time, I think we have to be careful with the balance that we don't... Um, underplay the achievements of women um, in perhaps what we might regard as uh, female industries, because I think we should take it, the female economy, women as consumers, seriously, and it's a really important part of our economy. So that's why the entrepreneur that I want to praise today is both female and young, and she's a fashion designer and manufacturer called Kelly Alder, who's from Lockerbie, and she designs and customises shoes and bags, and she's about to launch her own clothing collection called MISA, which stands for the Made in Scotland Initiative. Um, Kelly's business is called Glitzerati, 
And as the name suggests, um, there's a lot of bling involved. She has an absolutely extraordinary talent um, at customising shoes using crystals, beads, diamantes, and even seashells. And I know, I don't think it's any secret that the Cabinet Secretary does like her, her shoes. And uh, I would be delighted to invite her to, to meet Kelly and to see some of her designs because they really are fantastic. And uh, she's sold a lot of them uh, online. Now, Kelly left a well-paid job to start Glitzerati. And I just wanted to quote a little bit from um, her own uh, sort of life story, if you like. She said, like many other young people, I thought that my dream of starting a fashion business would be nothing more than a pipe dream. But after showing the world of Facebook some pictures of past designs, it took off with an influx of orders in several months. Um, she's now um, running third in the International Wedding Industry Awards, um, which uh, she's very, very proud of and wish her the best of luck in that because the, 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 the internet means that manufacturers like her can be based in Lockerbie and Dumfrieshire and they can sell all over the world. Um, I think it's also important, we talked about female orientated industries, she's absolutely passionate about manufacturing because manufacturing is an important uh, aspect to the fashion industry and that's why she called her clothing line the Made in Scotland initiative and I understand that there has been a move back towards um, clothing manufacturing to the UK from, say, China and India, which I think is, is a good thing. It naturally means that you uh, may that the costs can, can be higher, but the quality is also higher, and that certainly comes through in Kelly's work. Um, if I can just perhaps mention the fact that she's moved into a shop front in Dumfries, and uh, when I asked her um, in advance of this debate about the challenges that she faced, she did talk about how there's a huge number of empty shops in the high street, and she wasn't able to get any of them because they were, the, the people who owned them would much rather they sat empty. Um, than sell them, uh, rent them for a reasonable market rate. So she's moved into a shop that's slightly off the high street. Now, Kelly's in her 20s, but older women also have a lifetime of experience and that ability to respond to consumer demand. And I wanted to talk about a couple of them as well. Heather Hall and Linda Whitelaw, who have uh, set up a community cafe called The Usual Place in Dumfries. Um, they had a fantastic example of the benefits of social enterprise because they saw a gap for the training of young people who had additional support needs. And so this community cafe will work with the local college to help young people uh, train and work in the hospitality industry. Um, and as a result, many of them, they hope, will move into full-time work in the hospitality industry. Um, they've now secured fantastic premises um, in the old uh, Dumfries High School dining hall and have been awarded big lottery funding. So I think both these examples show that the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit is alive and well in Scotland. And certainly the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor shows a rise in early stage entrepreneurship here. And I think that with the government's strategy and commitment, we'll, we'll see that continue and uh, um, I, I feel quite optimistic about the future and feel we've moved past that hand-wringing stage of the past. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Now I call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Claire Adams. Uh, presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary said near the beginning of her speech that the enterprise journey begins in school, and I think we all uh, agree with that. In fact, uh, that was one of the reasons why the administration, of which I was a part ten years ago or so, uh, set up the strategy Determined to Succeed, which was uh, set up to develop enterprise skills uh, in schools, and there was a specific fund to facilitate that. Now, I believe that work is now embedded within the Curriculum for Excellence, and there is no specific funding, but it would be interesting to hear perhaps in the wind-up speech exactly uh, the, how effective or extensive that work has been, because I don't really have any sense of that, but I think we all recognise that what happens in schools is of very great importance. And, of course, that work uh, applies to boys and girls, young men and young women. But, uh, like others, I, I did take my cue from the subject of the debate initially, uh, women and the economy, uh, and I was assuming until recently that I would be speaking about that general agenda about new opportunities for women, about occupational segregation, women in STEM subjects, equal pay and childcare. And the reality is that a great deal of that uh, agenda is uh, still uh, very relevant to the more narrow focus we have for the debate in uh, enterprise. But I think the, the overarching 
uh, reality, and this was perhaps the most important thing that's been said in the debate so far, uh, was by Jen Jenny Mara when she talked about the impact of gender equality on the economy, because a lot of us come from the issue of gender equality from a human rights perspective, and that's absolutely right from the point of view of the rights of individual women. But the reality is, and there may be some people who are not totally susceptible to that perspective, the reality is that is a there's a fundamental economic uh, argument for uh, gender equality. And in a sense, that's at the heart uh, of the debate today. And Jenny Mara also, of course, rightly emphasised the theme of opportunities for women. So I, I won't repeat uh, the issues uh, about colleges, because I think our point of view on that is well known. But if I may just uh, uh, take this opportunity to repeat one uh, point that I've raised in two previous debates in the last seven days, but it was the children's minister who was on the front bench rather than Angela Constance. But I have got concerns in spite of all the good work of Skills Development Scotland that it's actually being skewed perhaps too much towards young people because women over 25 are often not getting the support they need to develop their skills. And the example I've given in two recent debates is the Child Care Academy in my constituency, wonderful uh, training opportunity for women returning to work, but over 25, the places are not being supported in the way they were in the past. So I've just taken that opportunity with Angela Constance sitting there. Oh, I give way. Angela Constance. grateful to, to Mr Chisholm for uh, g g giving way. Can I, um, I suppose, point out that the youth unemployment rate remains at 18.8%, .8 where the unemployment rate for women um, is 5.9%. So I do not think for one minute we should be moving away um, from support from young people, as intimated, I think, by Ms Mara uh, in her opening remarks. Uh, what I would draw the members' attention to, though, there are some very important initiatives, Fife College and Opito, through the Energy Skills Challenge Fund, uh, run by Skills Development Scotland, that is organising uh, uh, courses for women returners to get into energy, uh, coupled with childcare support also. I'd take extra time. Just to finish Chisholm. that point, if we could have 50% of the funding for under 25 women in the Child Care Academy and 50 for over uh, uh, 25, that would uh, serve the needs, I think, of my constituents. Now, Willie Rennie talked about uh, STEM subjects, so I won't repeat all the points there, but I think we know through the Royal Society of Edinburgh report that women with science, technology and engineering skills are one of Scotland's untapped resources. And they focused, of course, on people with the skills who weren't entering work, but the, the bigger problem, of course, is women uh, often not going into those areas of work at all, which leads to the whole issue of occupational segregation, which I think was so uh, um, helpfully uh, and constructively covered by uh, Sir Ian Wood in his report this week, and like others, I assume that would be the topic of today's debate, but uh, it's not, but I still think it's relevant to today's debate. For example, he has a recommendation about support networks should be developed uh, if you're entering a modern apprenticeship in occupations which are currently heavily gender segregated, and that, of course, relates to some of the other uh, recommendations we'll come to in a moment. Now, I was going to talk about how gender stereotyping starts in the early years, but I have no, no time uh, for that. So focusing particularly on the subject of today's uh, debate uh, enterprise, it is relevant uh, occupational segregation and gender stereotyping, surely to the stark fact that only 21% of Scotland's 339,000 SMEs are led by women, and men still are twice as likely uh, to start businesses compared to women. Now, if women-led businesses were equal to those of men, we are told Scotland's GVA would increase by a staggering £7.6 billion, pounds, which uh, reinforces, if anything, Thing does the general point that Jenny Mara made about gender equality and the economy. Now, I didn't think the Scotland Can Do report had a great deal of focus on gender, but it's fair to say that the Women in Enterprise follow-up uh, document certainly did have, and some of the recommendations of that have been commended already today. Mentoring and network and peer group support, role model projects and female uh, ambassadors, and the Cabinet Secretary gave uh, examples uh, of that, and there are others that could be given. For example, the Women in Renewable Energy Network uh, uh, is a good example uh, of that. Um, one of the other recommendations is exploring the creation of a soft loan fund, which leads to the general uh, point that there are a lot of uh, suggestions in these reports, and, uh, and I think we need to know how it's being implemented, whether it's being implemented, and how effective it's been, which leads, of course, to Jenny 
Kamara's point about the banking recommendation, an excellent recommendation, gender specific, specific support for bank staff uh, in order for them to be able to develop female customers' businesses. But as Jenny Mara said, let's have a report back about how effective that has been. And those recommendations in the Women in Enterprise report from the government were actually matched by a lot of the suggestions that came in the Hunter Centre survey of women-owned businesses, because the, 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 the priorities identified by that report were access to finance, re very relevant to the banking recommendation I, I mentioned a moment ago access to networking and, and contacts, uh, they say, mentoring. So again, it reinforces the points that uh, have been made uh, in uh, the government's uh, report. So I'm almost out of time. So I just, there are lots of quotes in that report as well. I was wanting to... Uh, I can give you some extra time. Oh, can you? Oh, well, I can I perhaps uh, use more than one quote. I was actually going to pick one out which reinforced Kez. Uh, Dugdale's um, uh, point because I was quite struck by some of the individual quotations from women in that report and one was uh, promote and advertise more successful women-run businesses that will serve as an example and inspiration for all uh, the rest. Uh, and it goes on to say maybe it would also help that the number of non-patronising events for women were increased or that there were more female networking uh, groups. So there are lots of very positive things in uh, that particular report, but all credit to the government in terms uh, of its Women in Enterprise report. But of course, uh, the devil, as always, is in the delivery. So I hope we'll hear about that uh, in due course. Many thanks. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think the debate this afternoon has, has shown that um, there's a great de deal of consensus across the Chamber um, about this issue. Um, I'd like to start, though, um, I know the Cabinet Secretary has said that she'll not be supporting the Labour motion, and I'm quite disappointed in the nature of that motion and that, that we can't reach consensus on that this afternoon. So I'm going to quote from the Audit Scotland report on Scotland's colleges from 2013, which says, in line with Scottish Government policy, the Scottish Funding Council issued guidelines to colleges to reduce courses that did not lead to recognised qualification or lasted less than 10 hours. And these are the very courses that Jenny Mara includes in her enrolment figure count that completely misrepresents the current situation in Scotland's colleges. And of course, that enrolment account includes ILA funded courses, which, um, well, I'm sure greatly enjoyed by the people who took part in them, did nothing to enhance workability skills or women's prospects in the workplace. And the Audit Scotland goes on to say that the total number of students attending college, as expressed by full-time equivalents, has remained broadly constant. And I'll take an intervention, yes, sir. Jenny Mara. I thank the, the member for, for giving way. It is an important point, she's right. But should, would she agree with me that the actual number of full-time equivalents uh, has changed because the government redefined, they reduced the hours of what a full-time equivalent is and so created an extra student. Would you not agree with that? It was reduced from 700, 720 hours and it is now 640 hours and that explains discrepancy in the figures. Claire Adams, I'll give you your time back. No, Ms Mara, what I will say is I fully supported um, the Scottish Government when they tackled the Tory model of the incorporations of colleges that was leading to colleges being in competition with one another and this regionalisation model and all ch colleges have risen to the challenge in delivering for the, the, um, the aspirations of that regionalisation model. And that is why we're in the position we are we're now. We're in a much better position to meet the requirements of both the young people, women returners, men returners, in colleges and the businesses in those areas than we ever have been since the incorporation of colleges by the Tories, which she seems to support. I do think it's very important that and it has been recognised across the chamber this afternoon that this is a, an endemic problem that we have rather than and, and something that has to be challenged um, in all areas. And the lack of women um, entrepreneurs and lack of young entrepreneurs, uh, the same barriers exist for women who want to be entrepreneurs as exist for most women in the workplace. And I do believe that we have to challenge these areas if we're going to effectively... Um, increase the number of women in businesses in all areas, but especially our entrepreneurs. Anyone who visits my parliamentary office in this building will see a prominent display of what I believe to be one of the most powerful messages about women. It's a poster from Close the Gap, which shows a scowling young girl sitting beside a smiling young boy. And the caption reads, 
prepare your daughter for working life, give her less pocket money than your son. And I think it's a very, very powerful message. And I, I'm often challenged by young people visiting my office about this image because they say that's so unfair. And it is unfair, but there's something about us as we get into business and grow older that, that sometimes that unfairness becomes invisible to us. It's very true that for women in Scotland, that it's still the case. It's shocking that more than 40 years since the Equal Pay Act in 1970, women are still paid less on average than their male counterparts. And a recent report from the UK's Office of National Statistics in December 2013 makes for an alarming reading. According to the ONS in 2012, the gender pay gap in the UK winded from 9.5% to 10% for full-time workers. And for part-time employees, many of whom are women, it's even wider, and it grew from 19.6% to 19.7%. And these, prob these um, figures should worry us. The payback gap is just one example of the ma many others, including women's representation in politics and STEM professions. And the number of women in senior positions in the workplace and in our boardrooms demonstrate that we are a long way away from achieving gender equality. And this affects women in every sector, in every area of of employment, scientists, technologists are no better served by the current system that we have in this country than, than other women workers. I listen very carefully to what um, my co-convener of the um, cross-party group on games, um, video games technology um, said about that sector. But I was a bit concerned about, uh, about Jenny's um, summing up of what, what, what the sector have been saying to her because this is much bigger than just a consumer-driven necessity. Um, if they're only looking at um, women in that sector, in that workplace, purely to sell more games, then they're missing what society is losing out on from not having women involved in every area of working life. And I was very glad that Willie Rennie raised the Royal Society of Edinburgh's 2012 paper, Tapping All Their Talents. Um, the Royal Society, of course, um, is maybe um, dealing with more mature sectors than the, the games industry. But I think they could learn a lot from what that report told us about women in the workplace who are qualified in STEM subjects. The report says women who remain in STEM workforce are still segregated by occupation. They're segregated by grade segregation. These forms of segregation significantly impact on both women's ability to achieve their potential and their earning capacity. And the number of women who advance to the most senior positions in STEM remains proportionately smaller than that of their male counterparts. And as a society, we have to examine what message we are sending out to women if in all areas of our working life, women do not achieve equality. And we know what the dangerous outcomes of this can be. It was very recently that South Lanarkshire Council agreed to settle its equal pay claim for 3,000 individuals, many of whom were women, on the failure to implement the Equal Pay Act in 1970. This led to women being denied a proper wage for their work that they had been undertaking, and it was 20 years in the making. And the Council will now have to face a £75 million bill. I will say to my Labour colleagues, and I listened very carefully to what Malcolm Chisholm said about gender equality being a human right, what message are we sending to the young women in North Lanarkshire where they have failed, Labour have failed to settle their equal pay claims? That's mums, sisters, brothers, um, you know, brothers as well, because there's men involved in this too, that um, they, they're being told that, that somehow they have of less worth in their communities. So I would urge everyone to tackle inequality at all areas in working life. Many thanks. Before we move on, could I just remind members to use full names? It's um, important for those who are watching our proceedings. It's a matter of accessibility. Anne McTaggart, to be followed by Christian Allard. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to have been given the opportunity today to participate in this important debate. And I would like to add my own support to the calls for greater participation of women in Scottish business. I would like to begin, though, my contribution by highlighting what I believe is the roadblock to the full inclusion of women and young people in entrepreneurial activities, and that is the continuing cuts to courses of further education. It is simply undeniable that the loss of 140,000 college places 
since 2007 is undermining the efforts to upskill our future business leaders. Scotland needs to provide the training and skills that are essential to meet the long-term needs of the economy, and we cannot achieve this if we cut the funding for courses most accessible to women. If women were to be responsible for a higher proportion of the business start-ups in Scotland, the potential for economic growth is staggering. Research from Women's Enterprise Scotland has shown that in Scotland only 21% of the 343,000 small and medium enterprises are run by women. It is thought that this gender imbalance could be costing our nation up to £13 billion every year. A reversal of this trend would be transformed transformational for our economy for gender equality in Scottish business and would significantly improve the lives of thousands of families across Scotland. In order to achieve this, women require the opportunity to learn new skills and build their capacities, capabilities and confidence in flexible and welcoming environments. This Scottish Government is making that task harder by closing off routes to learning for thousands of potential entrepreneurs. And the effect of that decision is reflected by the size of the gender gap in Scottish business rates. Last week, I used an oral question to ask the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism what specific measures the Scottish Government has taken to increase the gender gap in business start-up rates between men and women. In response, President Officer, the Minister did not detail one specific measure the Government has taken to encourage women to start their own businesses. And as a consequence, I remain, I remain deeply concerned that we could be doing much more to capitalise on the entrepreneurial potential of Scotland's women. President Officer, we should not make the mistake of presuming that Scotland's women are less keen less able or less enthusiastic about becoming self-employed. Recently, Women's Enterprise Scotland pu published a report on the state of women-led led in businesses in Scotland, which highlighted 87% of women entrepreneurs want to grow and expand their businesses. And the report also identified specific areas where women need support to help them achieve their aims. Occupational segregation has been identified as a key roadblock to encouraging women as business leaders and the report made specific recommendations to address this through changes such as the promotion of flexible working arrangements. In addition to this, I believe that we can best tackle gender segregation at its roots in the early years of education. We need to challenge the enforcement of gender roles on young people in schools and other places of learning. And we should encourage women and men towards employment in non-traditional occupations. It is only through challenging the expectations we have of men and women in our society and by providing equality of opportunity that women will be able to take their rightful place at the top of the table of Scottish business. Thank you very much. I now call Christian Allard to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to speak today in this debate, but I'm not quite sure if I'm qualified for the job. Improving entrepreneurship among women and young people in Scotland is what the Scottish Government motion says. And like Liberal Democrat Willie Rennie, I'm never a young or a woman. But it was a Liberal Democrat, a woman, Shirley Williams, Baroness Williams of Crosby, who claimed that George W. Bush had said to a UK Prime Minister, the problem of the French is that they don't have a word for entrepreneur. I would say, President Officer, that the problem of the word entrepreneur, a French word, is that it's too often a word associated with men, and men not always that young. In the Northeast, we know what an entrepreneur looks like. After all, Aberdeen is the powerhouse of the UK, said another UK Prime Minister the present one. However, this entrepreneurship culture was not born with the discovery of oil and gas in the North Sea. Uh, with the whiskey industry, farming and fishing, 
the creation of new and innovative businesses operating at home and abroad, so generations upon generations of Northeast entrepreneurs contributing to the wealth of this nation. Myself, working more than 30 years in the fishing industry, I met many of those entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, I will only need a few fingers of one hand to count the number of women I met during all the years, years women heading seafood businesses across Scotland. We heard a lot this afternoon uh, from different members, and I, as much as I would like to, to congratulate all the contribution before me, uh, we celebrated women entrepreneurs, uh, like Christine uh, McKelvey, uh, for example, it was a very good example of the, the, the crutches that maybe could need some help about uh, this, this particular entrepreneur. I'll maybe ask Christina McKelvey to give me the details. Uh, I, there is a real issue out there, and the real, the real issue is to tackle is occupational segregation. Because one of the most respected entrepreneurs in the Northeast is a man who came from the fishing industry to successfully uh, create one of the largest enterprises servicing the oil and gas sector here in Scotland and across the world. So Ian Wood has a can-do attitude that this Scottish government is promoting. And like the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Ian Wood wants underrepresented groups to realise their potential as entrepreneurs. How wonderful is it, Presiding Officer, that Sir Ian Wood has published his Commission's report on Tuesday. The final report of the Commission focuses on the importance of business and industry working with schools and colleges as a key factor in ensuring young people are more prepared for work and better informed in career choices. And this is very important for young people, young girls and young boys, like, like my colleague Dennis Robertson. I think if we can tackle that occupational segregation as early as possible is the key to success. There are also recommendations on encouraging and supporting more employers to recruit more young people. It also contains a number of recommendations on advancing equalities within education and youth employment. Here we are, once again, this government is working in partnership with the people that, now, that know best on how to develop the potential that we have here in Scotland. We need this collective Team Scotland that we heard this afternoon about. This collective Team Scotland approach to bring companies, universities, public agencies and customers together to exploit more opportunities that drive growth and increase export. Let me illustrate this, uh, President Officer. Here in Scotland, and, and uh, where we are at, and how this collaborative approach is working and working well. Last month, I had the pleasure to attend a skills summit in Aberdeen, delivered by the Scottish Council for Development and Industry, SCDI, and Skills Development Scotland, SDS, in partnership with OPITO. OPITO, we heard this afternoon, is the oil and gas industry's focal point for skills learning and workforce development. The event launched Scottish Apprenticeship Week 2014 and considered many issues such as employer engagement in schools. Apprenticeship is very important because in the Northeast, we know that a lot of young entrepreneurs have started as apprentices uh, uh, in, 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 in their younger career at, at, at the younger age. It, I was very impressed with the speaker on the day in Aberdeen that they organized a lineup and with a number of organizations that attended and participated to the discussions. I was particularly impressed by the first speaker, Scottish Government Cabinet Secretary for Training, Youth and Women's Employment, Angela Constance. President Officer, I was not the only one to be impressed. Scotland's newest Cabinet Secretary had to leave Aberdeen shortly after a speech. And let me illustrate to this chamber how it was received. The chair of the Aston University Engineering Academy, Professor Alison Olstead, told the Scottish audience how impressed she was with a government cabinet secretary working in partnership with others to help young people and women to see their economic potential unleashed. Professor Alison Holstead told us how different the UK government works down south, and I'm afraid she blamed most of it on someone who came from Aberdeen. Not an entrepreneur, but a politician. The UK Secretary of State for Education and the Member of Parliament for Surrey Heath, Michael Gove MP. We were warned by this professor from Birmingham that the Westminster government has a real lack of understanding when it comes to educate young people to be ready for work in the 21st century. She told us that we were on the right path here in Scotland. But as uh, some said before, it, uh, before me, and as so, 
uh, Woods Commission report concluded, we must understand that in many areas, such as advancing equalities with Scottish education and youth employment, there are clearly no quick fixes. When it comes to occupational segregation, schools are clearly an influence at a crucial stage, and although the problem is in entirety could never be resolved solely by school, the Equal Opportunities Committee that uh, Dennis Robertson uh, spoke about before me in his report, Women and Work, noted the view from industry that sector representatives should be brought into school to enhance careers advice by countering gender stereotypes. Because, President Officer, the subject choice at school is absolutely key to addressing gender segregation at the place of work. This is what this is why I would like this government to go further than the recommendations on Surrey and Woods Commission and to open primary schools as well as secondary schools to business and industry representatives. It has to be representatives and not individual businesses, in my view. As much as head teachers have opened their schools doors since the implementation of curriculum for excellence, teachers haven't got the time to consider multiple requests every year. This collaborative approach must be coordinated. Jenny Mara uh, talked uh, earlier this morning and in an amendment, and I, I'm sorry, I have to say, uh, regarding the number of places in colleges, she has no leg to stand on. Nothing should stand in the way of both gender taking advantage equally, equally of opportunities available in modern Scotland, presenting officer, and I trust this government to deliver this shared vision for the women and young people across Scotland. Thank you. I call Sandra White to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I apologise, President Officer, to the Chamber and the Cabinet Secretary for missing the beginning of the speech. I really must read uh, my notes you know, much better than that. I'm very sorry about uh, being a couple of minutes late. Uh, can I thank the Government for bringing forward this debate? I think it's most welcome and very timely. We're entering into a stage in Scotland which basically is historic. And to talk about entrepreneurship, women, young people being given the opportunity, I think is very timely in that particular point. And I'm not saying that as a political point, I'm just saying that the emphasis is there, and I think it's great to be able to speak ab about it. Uh, I think it's also very important that uh, as heavy industry has been in decline, as we all know, throughout various parts, uh, we look to other ways to engage people, and as said previously, and in particular, women and young children. I, I want to uh, mention Ailsa Mackay in this particular aspect. I don't know whether Ailsa would have been talking about entrepreneurship, but she would have certainly been talking about the economy of women in, in the, the country and the excellent work which she started and has been continued through others as well. Uh, I'm sure Ailsa would have been absolutely loving this particular debate. Also, could, if I could turn to the Labour amendment, and I think it's already been mentioned, which I think I'm a bit disappointed in as well, uh, but unfortunately I'm not overly surprised uh, when they count about the headcount figures which Labour have. You take absolutely no account, no account of the length of the courses, the intensity and the economic relevance of these courses. And, and I really thought that Jenny Mara... Uh, would have welcomed, uh, you know, basically what's been announced, not just by the government, but also, if you could just let me finish the bit that's, that was, I was going to talk about there, I would have thought that Jenny Mara would have welcomed the £30 million in funding to create an extra 3,500 college places. I'll, uh, I'll give way to the member. Jenny Mara. I thank the member for giving way, presiding officer. The 140,000 less places in colleges are figures straight from the Scottish government. Sandra White. I'm, I'm sorry, once again, very misleading, uh, you know, contribution from Jenny Mara of the Labour Party. I think it is, it's what you say, if you say it often enough, perhaps people will believe it. But I think I'll come on to, to that later on as well. I was going to go on to say that I thought you might have welcomed that, but I thought you might also have welcomed John Henderson, the Chief Executive of Colleges Scotland, who says basically it underlines the Scottish Government's recognition of the vital role of colleges and contributing to the strengthening of the Scottish economy. He was talking about the extra money that was being put in to create extra places. And in fact, I think your colleague Alex Rowley as well believes that the merger of the colleges, particularly in Fife, was a real opportunity uh, for that area and a fresh way to look at developing skills and training. So I thought you might have welcomed it in some point anyway, but uh, as I said, I wasn't uh, actually surprised uh, by that. And I think this has been a very good and interesting contribution from a number of people. Uh, Murder Fraser and Malcolm Chisholm both mentioned that the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, chaired by Sir Ian Wood, 
I think is a very substantial piece of work. And I do think it gets to the nub of some of the issues which we've not just been debating today, but which has followed on uh, from debates previously as well. And I too, like Murdo Fraser and others, I do look forward to debating this further and implementing a number of the, the representations that came from the Commission. Another area I thought was absolutely spot on came from Dennis Robertson and, and Anne McTaggart also. I think they really got it spot on when they mentioned about education. Because it doesn't just start when you enter the workforce, it starts when you're being educated. And I think education has a real role to play in confidence in building for women in particular, uh, basically to push through uh, the, the, the fact that uh, out there in the big bad world, as we might see it, the stereotyping of women, how they dress, how they look, what career choice is really up there for them. I think that's something, yeah, we know the media in all forms does it as well, but I think uh, Curriculum of Excellence, as Dennis uh, Robertson had mentioned, and mentioned by Anne McTaggart in that regards as well, is, is absolutely you know, relevant to making sure that young girls and women have the confidence in themselves to build up to that particular point. And I think we all have to challenge the stereotyping of women. And I would hope, and I do believe that uh, women in enterprise framework, can do framework, will improve entrepreneurships, you know, amongst women and also amongst uh, young people also. We can't forget that it's, it's targeted to them also in that, in that respect. Now, Kezia Dugdale, I thought, was in a very interesting contribution and, and very much appreciated as well. And one of the areas that she was talking about was role models. And I think that's really important because I think every one of us women here who are involved in politics, uh, we go out, we speak to not just members of our own parties, but young women as well, and they do see us as role models. Take yes, I'll take an intervention. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, the member agree with me that the role models that you're referring to, that the women uh, um, in the Renewable Energy Scotland wires are perfect examples of role models and they're ambassadors to try and bring the renewable sector into our young people and show that there is a pathway to the new energy for Scotland and there's at least 20% of them now involved in that profession. Sandra I think I think that's a very good example, uh, presiding officer. Certainly when I go around schools, renewable energy is one of the top issues that the young people, young women, as well as talk about. And I think that's a very, very good example. But the point I was trying to make as well was that young women look upon us politicians, women politicians, as role models. And I think we all have to sort of a, take a wee step back and think, think sometimes how we behave, not just in this place, but perhaps in other places too, because we are seen as role models for young women. And uh, what we put forward here, you know, can't... You, it does affect, it does affect. I and mean, I'll just ask uh, the women, in, in, in the, not just here, but throughout the parliament, to sit back and take a wee reflection, uh, sometimes, uh, but not exactly great role models. Uh, one of the, I'll come back to Christine Graham. I'm not mentioning Christine Graham in that. Mentoring and networking streams, they were also mentioned. I think that's an excellent way to involve women, and I always encourage young women to do that. We talked about entrepreneurs, and Michelle Moan was mentioned, but Kezia Dugdale and Christine Graham and others had mentioned, I think it was Joan McAlpine, mentioned the local entrepreneurs in their areas. I'm not going to go and talk about all the local entrepreneurs in my area. Uh, certainly it would take a while. But there's lots and lots, not just of young women, but young people as well, who are local entrepreneurs. And Kezia Dugdale was absolutely right. You can get someone like Michelle Moan or others who basically are an entrepreneur in that level, but all the local people who have local businesses, women and young people, are absolutely fantastic and we must make sure that they are known to everyone as well and give them the praise where, where it's uh, actually you know should be there in our area we've got sky park i won't name the names but basically they've got lots of young businesses as well in glasgow and they all take heed from each other and i think they take encouragement from each other as well so yeah local role models are absolutely great as well as local entrepreneurs as well thanks very much President officer Thank you. I call Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. Last year, the Equal Opportunities Committee produced a report which was widely welcomed across the Chamber on women in work. Among the issues the committee looked at during the inquiry were occupational segregation, flexible work and childcare, and the recommendations the committee made are now a matter of record. The committee did all of this against the backdrop of the slowest economic recovery in 100 years, 
a prolonged crisis in which women have been hit hardest. Excuse me, Ms McCulloch. If members wish to chat, perhaps they could do so outside the chamber. Margaret McCulloch. Thank you. The committee did all of this against the backdrop of the slowest economic recovery in 100 years, a prolonged crisis in which women have been hit hardest, women's unemployment outstrips men's unemployment, and the growing prevalence of underemployment is more likely to affect women. I want to pay tribute to the work of all of the members who served in the committee at that time. They have given us a comprehensive report, which we need to keep coming back to, and many of the findings of that report are relevant to today's debate. The reality of life for women in Scotland is that while we've seen huge progress over the decades, we are still far too often swimming against the tide. Assumptions about gender roles can influence a woman's chances in life. Occupational segregation persists in work and in training. Flexibility in work still doesn't serve women as well as it serves others, and there still just isn't enough childcare when it's needed and where it is needed. And, presiding officer, many of those inequalities and inconsistencies are reflecting the gender gap that we can see in the world of business too. In the action plan we are discussing today, Professor Sarah Carter points out that men are twice as likely to start a business as women. Not only that, but the levels of women's ownership in business in Scotland are low compared to even other high-income countries. Perhaps if there was a fairer distribution of that high income, then we wouldn't be quite so far behind our neighbours. But I want to focus my remarks today on the practical the steps that government, industry and their partner organisations can take to help women in work and promote women in business. And as a woman who did set up my own business, I want to identify the action points which I feel are the most significant and warrant further discussion. The Labour motion stresses the importance of education, and we have already explained in some depth why we believe college cuts are short-sighted and why courses changes have adversely affected women. And as discussed, there is a growing consensus around the need to bring more women into so-called non-traditional roles, the STEM subjects and modern apprenticeships. To that end, I would welcome the recent progress we have seen with career-wise industry placements and the much-needed SDS Equality Action Plan. However, the Minister will know that this year saw the introduction of new contribution rates in the modern apprenticeship programme, and there are certain occupational areas where after 10 years of rates being frozen, we are now seeing reductions. My concern is not only that some of those occupational areas are important to the Scottish economy, but there are training providers who will no longer be able to cover their costs. What impact could that have on apprenticeships, and what impact might that have on women in training? Presiding officer, the action plan calls for engagement with a number of organisations, including the Prince's Trust, Scottish Enterprise, HIE and Business Gateway to develop mentoring and networking for women. I fully support those efforts and the role model project. The action plan calls for gender specific support and rightly so, because sometimes gender neutral policy reinforces pre existing inequalities instead of addressing them. And the action plan calls for collaboration with Cooperative Development Scotland to raise awareness of the consortium cooperative model a model which I have spoken in support of before, because it could help entrepreneurs compete for public contracts. Presiding officer, the inequalities that women face are a waste, a waste of talent and potential that is costing our economy £7 billion. To sustain those inequalities is immoral, and it is illogical. So together, let us close the gap. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I call, uh, turn to closing speeches, I finally call Gordon Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland's economy depends on a number of key sectors, including oil and gas, food and drink, financial services, life sciences and creative industries. But it also depends on small businesses to deliver economic growth, not only across these important areas of our economy, but in every business sector. There are just short of 350,000 small businesses in Scotland, providing over 1 million jobs, which represents half of all private sector employment in Scotland. In order to continue our economy uh, growing, we need to encourage the creation of new businesses, the expansion of existing businesses, and encourage those who can to export and sell online. 
The people of Scotland are this country's greatest assets. We have a highly educated population, with 39% of our working adults having either an HND degree or professional qualification, compared to the 35% for the UK as a whole. And here in Edinburgh, that proportion is even higher at 54% of the adult population. What we need to do is encourage, nurture and support budding entrepreneurs. And the Global Entrepreneurship uh, Monitor, published by the University of Strathclyde Business School, measures how well we perform in that area. Regarding start-ups, it compared Scotland's total early-stage entrepreneurial activity with the other 26 innovation-driven sovereign nations. They found that Scotland had significantly higher rates of developing or new business owner enterprises across the working population than Italy and Japan. Scotland's rate at 6.8 per cent was on a par with other European countries like France, Germany and Norway. This rate, however, differed between male and females, with the male TEA rate in Scotland being 8.5 per cent compared to the UK's 8.7 per cent and female start-up rates being 5.2 per cent in Scotland compared to 5.8 per cent across the UK. The GEM report suggested that women entrepreneurs differ widely in their motivation for starting a business, including career constraints, work family balance and financial freedom. The report also found that significant wealth creation tended to be of a secondary importance for most but not all women entrepreneurs and as a result many of the new businesses are in personal services and retailing where relatively low start-up capital is required. By encouraging and supporting women to start up new businesses to the same level of male start-ups, grow existing businesses and, where possible, start to export, we would generate more than £7 billion for the economy. The Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship estimates that this would create around 35,000 direct jobs. Women's Enterprise Scotland carried out a survey of women-owned businesses in Scotland. The survey found that access to finance was the most frequently mentioned need, with only 50 per cent finding their banks helpful. Business support was identified as another area where assistance was required, not only at the early stages of developing, developing a business, but later when businesses are at the point of wishing to grow. Those who had access to a mentor found that the vast majority of them proved to be very helpful in providing advice. Business Gateway was identified as a main source of business support, helping around 10,000 startups every year, with two-thirds of businesses started by women finding their service helpful. The Women Enterprise Scotland survey also found that women recognised that despite the challenges, they should consider growing their businesses. And part of their key findings in the survey highlighted that 87% of women-owned businesses aim to grow with 27% aiming to grow rapidly. Another area where we need to encourage more entrepreneurship is with young people. Entrepreneurship should be recognised as a valid, viable and rewarding career choice for all young people. The self-employment rate for 16 to 24-year-olds is currently a disappointing 2%. The OECD report policy brief on youth on entrepreneurship highlighted the barriers that the young face, preventing some from turning ideas into projects. They arise in the areas of social attitudes, lack of skills, inadequate entrepreneurship education, lack of work experience, undercapitalisation, lack of networks and market barriers. And that is across Europe, not Scotland or the UK. We need to address these issues, and part of this is being addressed by Curriculum for Excellence, that ensures that enterprise education is embedded right across a young person's learning. In addition, there are good examples of schemes aimed at encouraging young people to consider starting their own business, contained in the Scottish Government's report, Scotland Can Do, that highlights the vision of Scotland as a world-leading entrepreneurial and innovative nation. Presiding Officer, I'd like to, take, like to highlight two of them. Micro Tyco, Micro Tyco is a groundbreaking enterprise challenge run by the Wild Hearts Foundation that has brought together over 10,000 participants from school children to business executives. Micro Tyco's vision is to ignite the spirit of enterprise across our culture. 
Taking inspiration from the spirit of Wildheart's microfinance clients in the developing world, MicroTyco challenges teams to grow one pound into as much money as possible in just four weeks. Its unique combination of inspiration, business mentorship, positive peer pressure and ethics produces incredible results. Today, over £500,000 has been returned from just 1,900 one-pound loans. In addition, there is the Young Innovators Challenge, which was won by a young female graduate from Edinburgh College of Art. A competition aimed at encouraging young people in college, training or university to come up with innovative ideas. Funded by the Scottish Government, the competition is run by the Scottish Institute for Enterprise. In 2013, competition entrants were asked to create innovative solutions to challenges set by industry leaders. Finalists then pitched their ideas to a business panel of experts for the chance to win development funding of up to £50,000 and business support. The Scotland Can Do report highlights what we can do to support more young people and females to become entrepreneurs. A yes vote will release the energy and confidence in order to take up that challenge. Thank you very much. We now turn to closing speeches and I call on Liz Smith with around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, I think this uh, debate has uh, been very interesting. And if nothing else, we have learnt how to mend a doorbell, thanks to uh, Joan McAlpine's step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, as many members have said, establishing a new business or harnessing an old one and developing it with new opportunities is a huge challenge to anybody. Uh, those people who have the ideas and the special skills which they believe will bring substantial dividends and not just financial ones are very precious assets within any economy, uh, not just because they are also the willing uh, people who take on the accompanying risk. Uh, several members have also reminded us the scale of that venture can vary enormously and it can obviously involve a very different mix of leadership, initiative and innovation, as well as the usually considerable need for good financial backing and, of course, there is also the long-standing debate about whether entrepreneurship uh, is innate or whether it can be taught. Now, Christian Allard mentioned the French connection, as I would expect him to do, but the term actually goes back to the 1730s, but it was not till the 1950s when the economist Joseph Schumpeter examined entrepreneurship in detail, most especially what factors give rise to what he described as the gale of creative destruction whereby something new and better emerges out of the process of industrial mutation. Now, I like that concept, and I raise it because I think there is actually an analogy with Sir Ian Wood's deliberations published earlier in the week. Sir Ian, obviously himself a hugely successful entrepreneur, has, via his own leadership, sought to take the initiative and innovate when it comes to the structure of Scottish education. Like Tom Hunter and Jim McCall, he knows only too well that if Scotland is to lead the world when it comes to entrepreneurship, then it has much more to do to inspire women and young people. If women now account for approximately a third of global entrepreneurs, and there are encouraging signs also about the rise in female self-employment, we also know that women often feel constrained. Perhaps it's an issue of confidence, as was uh, mentioned by Jenny Mara. Sometimes it is economic difficulties, sometimes it is family commitments, and it's sometimes attitudes, and Christine Graham uh, was very, uh, very good in outlying, uh, outlaying some of her constituents in that respect. Their economic profile, of course, is often different. That was a point made by my colleague Murdo Fraser, and it should be acknowledged as such, since this has huge implications for policy making. It requires a diversity within skills and training, and again, it is a theme from which our perspective is one of the most important themes within the Wood Report dismantling the structural straitjacket when it comes to responding to the needs of a wide diversity of pupils and fostering their own ambition. That report sets out a vision which is based upon the successful application of what works best in practice, something I think is always a good guide for successful entrepreneurship, and it recognises that providing the best opportunity for everyone does not depend upon putting them all through the same educational experience. The report also recognises that addressing the attainment gap is essential if we are to enhance that educational experience. Spreading the good practice of entrepreneurship will be held back if we cannot do something about that attainment gap. 
because it's simply unacceptable that we still have one in six senior pupils leaving school without being functionally literate, almost half of young people in Scotland leaving school without uh, higher qualifications, only one in four Scottish businesses being willing to hire people directly from education below that higher level, and among 16 to 24 year olds uh, now being uh, almost 20% of the total unemployment. Now there are good changes happening, but these are stark statistics which undoubtedly do hold back the desire for better entrepreneurship. But as uh, I think three members have mentioned, there has to be an accompanying change in attitudes. And there are some lessons to be learnt uh, from abroad, as Gordon MacDonald has just uh, mentioned, and especially, I think, from some of the key European neighbours, where there is an absence of the uh, unfortunate tiered structures which do label young people and which tend to restrict social mobility, where there is a greater flexibility of movement uh, between school and college and university. And I think there is a, a very strong need for the collective responsibility that was spoken about by Willie Rennie and his contribution. For far too long, I think Scottish education has been undermined by quite a powerful uh, feeling of gender stereotypes which have reflected uh, fairly deeply entrenched cultural and social economic preconceptions and they have had a detrimental effect on the Scottish economy. Take for instance the extremely troubling statistic that in 2012-13 just 3% of new modern apprenticeship starts in engineering were undertaken by women or the fact that females are far more likely to undertake level 2 apprenticeships uh, than males. Claire Adamson made the point about the uh, Royal Society. Uh, Professor Dame Jocelyn Burnell is uh, the new and also the first female head of the Royal Society in Edinburgh and she's one I think of 36 female physics professors in the UK and she made the comment that you can convert the teachers and you can convert the kids but if they go home to find that um, having said that they want to be a physicist and the parents question why on earth they would want to do that then it obviously makes life very difficult. To the Commission's credit, I think they were extremely alive uh, to exactly this problem, which explains why they have advocated that schools monitor the gender split, with particular reference to the STEM subjects, and engage with employers so that real-life experience is articulated to, to all students, regardless of gender. And Margaret McCulloch made the strong point of her own uh, experience in this regard. Of course, schools are only part of the equation, and it is therefore entirely appropriate that the Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland are also tasked with promoting the merits of STEM subjects to both girls and boys. And on this point, the retention rate for young female graduates in STEM subjects is truly uh, shocking. The statistics were given to us by Willie Rennie, and that is a major area uh, of concern. What makes, I think, it a little bit more troubling is that the, and also highly probable, that the uh, next batch of successful Scottish entrepreneurs will inevitably be involved in the life sciences and information uh, technology, yet we still face a situation where uh, the uh, new qualifications uh, perhaps don't reflect that just as strongly uh, as they should. And uh, I instance higher geology as one classic example of the debate around that just now is very strong. So just to uh, finish off, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I, I think this is a hugely important area uh, of development. It does require changing attitudes just as much as it does about policy uh, work. Uh, and we have great pleasure in supporting uh, the government's motion, the Labour amendment, and obviously the amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser. Many thanks. I now call on Jenny Mara with around nine minutes or so. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think it's been an enjoyable and interesting and wide-ranging debate this afternoon across uh, a number of different topics, on uh, mainly concentrating on women, business, uh, women's access to training and skills and their, and their businesses. And I think we've heard some really uh, great and uh, nice and uh, local stories this afternoon about uh, women's success in business, especially from Christine Graham, her experience in, in the borders, and Joan McAlpine's uh, region down in the south of Scotland, as particularly taken by uh, the, the, the minister's love of, of um, Joan McAlpine's friend in her, in her business. I'm quite tempted to perhaps um, look them up myself. But um, I think the, the stories about women in their communities 
setting up uh, successful businesses are, are always good to hear. And I know that uh, all members around this chamber have their own stories, and there are certainly uh, many from my region too. But I was reflecting as I listened to both the members on their stories um, and thinking about what, what, what came behind their stories and what led them to that point and what challenges they faced as they were setting up their businesses. And I was really struck by the... Um, the focus in the Women in Enterprise report on access uh, to, to finance, because I hear from so many local businesses, as I'm sure all members do around this chamber, about uh, the difficulty for, for emerging companies to access traditional uh, methods of loans and finance from banks. And then when you speak to the banks, they say, actually, no, it's a perception issue. We are engaging on a local level. And I think there is still um, this gap in the middle that, that we do need to bridge. But I was also reminded, as, as, as I was listening to the members, about a story from my own region about a microfinancing project that has been set up in Dundee, which is helping women set up their own business where they find it difficult to access traditional finance from banks. And I was particularly struck by this story because microfinancing, in my head, is something that is um, very much connected with the de developing economies in this world, where profit-driven financing is very difficult to come by. Um, some charitable and self-sustaining microfinancing projects step in. And I have to say, I was surprised um, but perhaps encouraged that these uh, projects were actually uh, taking place in our own economy. And I wonder, actually, if the Minister, uh, sorry, the Cabinet Secretary, would be open to perhaps in her conversations with banks to, um, to expanding that remit, to, to have a conversation with the microfinancing projects that are, that are working in Scotland to see the challenges that, that they are facing in getting finance to women and in starting their own enterprise. So I wonder if she would have those conversations uh, to ensure that all finan financing options are meeting the needs of female entrepreneurs uh, to do what she can to improve the financing situation and report back to this chamber on those conversations. Now, to turn to um, and other points that were raised in this debate this afternoon, presiding officer, the minister in her intervention to Malcolm Chisholm, I think suggested that I was asking her to choose between college places for young people um, and college places for women. Presiding officer, I think the Scottish Government have already made that choice. Um, I believe, and Labour believes, that training and skills for young people and women returner, returners in our colleges underpins our economy. It says so in the Wood Commission report, which the Scottish Government has rightly accepted this week. We are not suggesting that college places for women returners and young people is a choice. The Scottish Government have made that choice. We think further education is a key priority and places for both young people and women returners should be fully supported. Now, the Scottish Government gave higher education a much more generous settlement than FE, but that was their choice and that is the responsibility of government. Malcolm Chisholm said in his um, always eloquent contribution, that there is a fundamental economic case for gender equality. And I think, uh, with all due respect, I think Claire Adamson misunderstood um, my, my point uh, on the economic imperative behind gender equality. I didn't think I had to labour with this chamber, my own and Labour's commitment to gender equality for human rights issues and the reasons of general well-being. But for the record, uh, we believe that gender equality enhances all of these, but wanted this afternoon to highlight the economic imperative of women's participation and unexploited markets. Claire Adamson also said that colleges are now in a better position to support women returners. I have, to dis I have to say to the member, I fundamentally disagree with that point that she made. And again, I would say to her with all respect that the SNP are ignoring their own figures coming from their own government. There are 93,000 fewer women studying part-time since 2007, since this government took power. This figure is from the Scottish Government. It is from the Scottish Funding Council, the government's own agency. And I don't think we are really in a position in this chamber to ignore or dispute these figures. 
Yes. Claire Adamson. I, I, I think in my speech, and I, I, I do appreciate Ms, Ms. Mara um, accepting the intervention, that it's Audit Scotland that said that the guideline said that they had to juice courses that didn't lead to recognised qualifications and then were less than 10 hours. Can she say what, what courses that aren't a recognised qualification and were less than 10 hours help women into employment? Jenny Mara. Absolutely can. Non-recognisable qualifications in colleges are often access courses which women really use to get back into education and refresher courses. And if the Minister won't make these a priority in counting them, whatever the advice from Audit Scotland, then I think that shows a fundamental misunderstanding of how women in Scotland access further education and their way into training skills and then into employment. And I hope that that is something Thing that the Minister can reflect on. We should definitely be counting these courses. Now, I think the Wood Commission rightly came up this afternoon, but I would reiterate my call to the Cabinet Secretary that we have a full and proper debate because Sir Ian Wood spent a considerable amount of time and care over this report before, this, before the summer recess um, is on us. But I think there are a number of points that were rightly raised by the Conservative Amendment and by the Conservative speakers. Um, Engagement of the private sector in schools, this is something that Ian Wood uh, stressed with myself and Joanne Lamont last week, that you know, businesses should be going into schools more often to make the case and to, to raise aspiration amongst young people as well. Um, the inadequacy of one week's work experience was highlighted by Murdo Fraser, and I completely and utterly agree with this. I've got work experience uh, students from Dundee in my office at the moment. I know my own experience of this and, and colleagues. And to really get a flavour of different types of work in public sector, in the private sector, in different kind of, of businesses is important for young people, and especially young people that don't have the uh, connections through their parents or family or family networks to get that experience. And I think Ian Wood was suggesting perhaps four, three or four weeks work experience over the years. And that is something I think this parliament should uh, take very seriously and address. Ian Wood was also very concerned about... Yes. I find, I find it quite interesting, and, and I'm not necessarily giving you my opinion here, but the one week work experience is something that the Eastern Bartonshire Youth Council have campaigned very strongly to keep when Eastern Bartonshire Council did away with it. So I think in this area, it's probably as well to, that we need to listen to young folk as well um, as everyone else. Jenny Mara. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, work experience needs to be enhanced. I think, I think they were right to campaign to keep it, but there needs to be, to be more than one week. It needs to be funded and it needs to be, to be structured. Um, Ian Wood is also very keen to address gender segregation in the workplace. That's something else that has been raised this afternoon. And I think Murdo Fraser raised an important point about, the f about learning from Germany and the focus on STEM subjects, which is absolutely key. Willie Rennie uh, picked up on this as well, talking about the rate of loss of women from higher education in STEM subjects into employment is double that of men. And that is something that I think we need to seriously address. I think more needs to be done to ensure that talent is retained in our workforce. And Willie Rennie stressed the importance of college places and refresher courses um, underpinning entrepreneurship and the Wood Commission's proposals. I thought my colleague Kezia Dugdale made a very important intervention, as she always does, about work readiness, but I think made a very critical point about work readiness to set up your own business. And she talked about colleges looking at tax, risk, marketing across courses so that students, when they come out, are not just willing to apply for a job, but they are willing to then try and access finance themselves and set up their own business for their own self-employment and to create jobs in the wider economy. Could I could ask you to begin to draw to a conclusion now, Okay, please. thank you, presiding officer. Um, we are greatly concerned about the low rates of participation by women in entrepreneurship. Women's enterprise is difficult to accurately define and enumerate, but we know it's estimated that in 2012 only around 21% 
of Scotland's thousands of SMEs were majority led by women. And this is a figure that must concern us. These reports, presiding officer, today are welcome. They're emanating from the Women's Employment Summit. But I would very much welcome us coming back to this in six or nine months' time to see if the initiatives in these reports are working and take stock of progress. Many thanks. I now call on Angela Constance to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until 5 p.m. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I think this afternoon has uh, largely uh, been a very positive and, at times, uh, humorous debate, but uh, nonetheless a very constructive debate and informative debate as we move forward. Presiding Officer, if we are uh, really going to reignite that spirit of entrepreneurship uh, which Scotland has been renowned for, uh, we really do need to do so uh, with women and young people playing uh, a full and active part. And the reality is uh, that we can't successfully reignite uh, that spirit of entrepreneurship uh, without uh, women and young people. And as people are our greatest asset, uh, we very much need to be tapping in uh, to all uh, our talents. Now, there is a strong and growing network of support uh, that is becoming increasingly uh, focused on the needs of women and young people. And Women's Enterprise Scotland is leading uh, the implementation group uh, to ensure that the, the aspirations, which I think we all share, actually translate into action. And we are actively tackling uh, the gender gap uh, in enterprise. The Women's and Enterprise Framework and Action Plan um, arose from work that was led in collaboration uh, by Professor Sarah Carter uh, after uh, the Women's Employment Summit. And the point about collaboration uh, is very important. All the key public, private and third sector partners are signed up to this. And in this instance, this includes the Royal Bank of Scotland, Business Gateway, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Prince's Trust. And if I can uh, quote Jackie Briarton, MBE, who is the chairperson of Women's Enterprise Scotland, who said, we are the only country in Europe that has got this kind of collaborative policy framework that we can now go forward and actually create an environment that is far more supportive. Now, in terms of young people, it's been uh, acknowledged throughout the debate uh, that enterprise and entrepreneurship uh, has become a distinct outcome uh, of Curriculum for Excellence. And, of course, self-employment can be for young people a route out of unemployment, but it also has to be seen in its own right as a positive career choice. And we do very much have to view enterprise and innovation uh, as important to everyday life and work. And in that regard, I was absolutely delighted to see uh, four apprentices, uh, aircraft maintenance apprentices from uh, Presswick Airport, uh, who were amongst uh, some of the winners in the Youth Initiative Challenge, uh, the first uh, apprentices uh, to, to win uh, in that uh, accolade. And I would also like to draw to members' attention that the very successful uh, Bridge to Business uh, initiative that has been piloted uh, in Glasgow City College that I spoke about in my opening remarks is also going to be rolled out uh, across the college estate and there are already six uh, colleges that are uh, interested in that. Now, given the, the breadth of the work that is already going on across the public, private and third sector, I believe for the sake of our young people and women who are making their way in the world of business currently, and also those young people and women who want to make their way in the world of enterprise and entrepreneurship, and also organisations uh, like the Association of Scottish Businesswomen and Women's Enterprise Scotland, that it is imperative that we debate uh, these issues uh, in Scotland's Parliament, uh, because all these stakeholders um, deserve uh, a debate that is very focused uh, on uh, enterprise and entrepreneurship. And for that reason, I want to thank those speakers who focused uh, on enterprise and entrepreneurship. I do recognise that this debate has far broader uh, synergies about the economic experience of women uh, in the wider world and, of course, uh, the Wood Report, which I will uh, come to later. 
but it was excellent to hear of those great examples of innovative women who are making their way uh, in the economy and in the business world at uh, the length and breadth of Scotland. And of course, Christine Graham uh, mentioned Lynn Mann uh, from Supernatural uh, Oils, who I've had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, Lynn is uh, also um, a, a role model and mentor uh, as well, and so is very much uh, leading the way and supporting others to follow in her footsteps. Christina McKelvey spoke about uh, inventions uh, with social purpose. And Joan McAlpine, I think, made a very important point that as well as getting more women to be uh, active in areas of the economy where they're currently uh, underrepresented, such as uh, in engineering, we also need to value the work and the businesses that women are attracted to uh, establishing. And uh, all I can say to Joan is I very much uh, look forward uh, to receiving that invitation to meet with her and her constituent uh, who is uh, designing uh, fabulous shoes. Uh, I am, of course, uh, a great supporter uh, of the, the, the creative industries. But on a more serious point, and it was a point tapped into by both uh, Joan McAlpine uh, and Murder Fraser, that you know, women um, have a tendency to start up different types of businesses. And Murdo Fraser also said uh, that women's startups tend to be uh, self-funded. And that, of course, uh, raises uh, the question of access to finance. And I'm, of course, more than happy, as requested by Jenny Mara uh, and Malcolm Chisholm, uh, to report back in the appropriate format, um, whether it's to Parliament or to them uh, individually, about how those broader uh, discussions uh, about supporting women to actually access uh, finance to make their business aspirations become uh, a reality. But it's also really important to uh, recognise, because Murdo Fraser touched on the point that the motivation for some women uh, to establish uh, their own business is not quite simply just to make money. But in terms of 87% of those female-led businesses, these are businesses that are actually seeking to grow. So we should never uh, underestimate uh, the ambition of women seeking to make uh, their own way in the world. I very much enjoyed Kezia Dugdale's contribution. Uh, she largely focused on uh, a different uh, type of economy and the need uh, and the imperative need to support homegrown businesses. And I suppose what I'd like to draw her attention to is that values-based businesses is emphasised in Scotland can do, and alternative models are discussed, celebrated and supported, uh, such as the co-op model, which Margaret McCulloch uh, also mentioned, uh, employee ownership and also uh, social enterprises. And there's a very important uh, point that talks about growth uh, for the strength uh, of all. I would also like to pay tribute to the work that Women's Enterprise Scotland is doing in terms of uh, leading the way in terms of role models and uh, mentoring support. And that's a good example uh, of action uh, that's taking place uh, here and now. Now, Willie Rennie spoke very eloquently about the, the leaky pipeline, uh, the proportion of women science graduates who either don't pursue or who drop out from STEM careers and how that costs the economy £170 million. Pounds. And I very much hope that the Liberal Democrats uh, at some point in the future use their debate time uh, to bring back their amendment that was unsuccessful in being uh, selected today. And I hope that he's reassured that this government works very closely uh, with organisations like Equate and indeed we fund organisations like Equate uh, who are crucial in the implementation um, of CareerWise which is essentially about early intervention, uh, role models and work experience uh, for uh, young girls so that they can actually experience what it like, is like to pursue uh, a STEM uh, related career and I have absolutely no doubt, presiding officer, uh, that we will indeed uh, return to the issue uh, of occupational uh, segregation because it's an agenda that I feel utterly uh, committed to because while I, as a former social worker, will always value the work that women uh, are traditionally uh, attracted to, there is no doubt about it uh, that we need to improve the representation of women in science, technology and engineering and mathematical uh, related careers. We um, are not alone in that problem. It's a problem faced right uh, across Europe, uh, but there is an opportunity uh, for Scotland to be an exemplar and to lead the way in this area. 
Now, President Officer, members quite rightly um, spoke uh, highly uh, of the, the very recent and very timorous uh, Wood Commission uh, report, and I very much welcome uh, the cross-party support and interest uh, in the, the work of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. And if I can reiterate that in terms of this Government's position, that we very much do view this as a landmark report that has the capacity to transform the career prospects uh, of young women and men in this country and as I said earlier in my opening remarks that I will indeed be returning uh, to Parliament to focus very much uh, on the implementation uh, of the Wood Commission um, I think on the 17th uh, of this month um, with our partners in local government and COSLA we will have to work through all 39 recommendations how they are implemented and how they are resourced. Uh, but that is something that I am very much uh, cherishing uh, the opportunity to do, because when we established uh, the Commission, we were very struck uh, on these benches that the countries with the lowest levels of youth unemployment were also the countries with the very well-established vocational education and training systems that were highly regarded uh, by employers. And our ambition is indeed far, far greater than and returning to pre-recession levels uh, of youth unemployment. And we have to be doing far, far better by our young women and our young men, both in times of economic growth and indeed uh, economic challenge. I'm always struck by the fact that prior to the world turning upside down in 2008 and the economic downturn, that in this country, youth unemployment peaked at 14% at a time of economic growth. And that indicates strongly to me that not only do we have an economic problem uh, to reverse, that we also have systemic issues through every stage of our society to address if we are going to ensure that all of our young people get the very best start to their working lives. And I'm very pleased, presiding officer, to report that early progress uh, is being made on the Wood agenda. A few months ago, there was an announcement made with regards to uh, leaving Mouth uh, and Fife. Um, Ayrshire College and North Ayrshire College yesterday have also uh, uh, announced some very interesting work and there's a steam of head uh, going on ahead to um, make good progress with early uh, pathfinders and the government has also uh, announced uh, the expansion of the modern apprenticeship scheme uh, from 25,000 starts a year uh, up to uh, 30,000 uh, starts a year fuelled by a growth uh, in STEM subjects. And I think we have, of course, uh, President Officer, touched uh, on issues in and around the, the college sector to today. Now, but it is important to uh, recognise uh, that the Wood Report described the college sector as re-energised and well-placed yeah. to take forward this agenda. And if I can end on a quote yeah. uh, from Sir Ian Wood, who says... Our Commission sat at an opportune time to look at significantly enhancing Scotland's approach to vocational education and youth employment. The reforms which have already taken place in schools and colleges, as well as the growth in the number of modern apprenticeships, provide a strong platform for change. So, presiding officer, I hope we can all move forward on that vein. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on improving entrepreneurship among women and young people in Scotland. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10230 on substitution on committees. Minister. Question. This motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10214.1 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend motion number 10214 in the name of Angela Constance on improving the entrepreneurship be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 10214.1 in the name of Jenny Mara is as follows. Yes, 51. No, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10214.3 in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend motion number 10214 in the name of Angela Constance on improving entrepreneurship be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. <laughs> I was surprised too. The next, <laughs> the next question is that motion number 10214 in the name of Angela Constance as amended on improving entrepreneurship be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10230 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on substitution on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. I now close this meeting.